my position that the entire existence as a human race, we have strived for two primary goals, and that's it. Reproduce, right? The second one is reduction of stress. Mm. We're now realizing though. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. Why do you feel like people in general are weak in, in, the, in the forms of like their body structure, their muscle structure, and their mindset? And obviously, I don't want to generalize this because there are a lot of mentally tough and strong humans, but it just feels like it's getting weaker and weaker with technology, with the, the access to comforts. Mm. Everything is so quick and easy. Why do you feel like this is happening? And what is the downside to a weaker society? I think about this on a continuum of what we call resilience to sensitivity. And every action you're doing, you're moving towards one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on what insult you're looking at, some things you wanna be highly sensitive to, some things you wanna be very resilient. So not one of these is better than the other. It's a paradigm, easy example. It's probably good for you to be very sensitive to alcohol, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Like, I don't want you to be so sensitive to where if you have a drink of alcohol, you have a mental breakdown for seven months. Like that's not, that's way too sensitive. Uh -huh. But I want you so resilient to it that you could drink excessively and have no physical consequence, right? Because you're gonna pay for that eventually. Mm. So that's something we probably wanna be generally sensitive to. Sure. Generally resilient is probably something to like even carbon dioxide buildup. So what you don't realize, and we could go into metabolism a little bit if you want, but every time you take a breath in, you're breathing in oxygen, O2. When you exhale, you're breathing out CO2. So the difference is you've added a carbon. Where does that carbon come from? Mm. Your fat and your carbohydrates that are stored in your body, which are your true primary ways in which you derive cellular energy, are just big long chains of carbon. In fact, that's why we call it a carbohydrate. So when you breathe, you're breathing out fat. Or carbon, or carbohydrate. It's just a carbon, it doesn't matter. So whether you're getting your fuel from this carbon that's been hydrated, which is, that's all carbohydrates are. Mm -hmm. One molecule of carbon plus one molecule of water. Well, fat is typically in this, what we call triglyceride form. So it has these three carbon backbones and it has tri, one, two, three, long chains of carbons. So either way, you're talking about a 40 carbon molecule or a six carbon molecule. Okay. It's being metabolized in the cell in either direction. One's gonna go through the mitochondria initially. One's gonna go in the cytoplasm and then through the mitochondria, but they're either way they're gonna end in the mitochondria. They're gonna come out as carbon. That carbon's gonna be attached to oxygen. The <sighs> mitochondria like is, in, is in the entire body or is it mostly in the brain? Mostly muscle. Mostly in the muscle, the mo not the, in the brain. The, it's gonna be a lot up there, but you have the more brain. muscle than you have brain. Gotcha. So total volume wise, it's gonna be a lot. Yeah. So you're going to, however you're metabolizing energy from any of your system, it's gonna be accessing and kicking out carbon dioxide. When that level rises in your system, that's gonna cross up in your brain. You have various receptors throughout your body that are gonna tell you we've got a rise in carbon dioxide. The thing that drives your ventilation, the sensation to breathe, it's not actually running low on oxygen. It's running high in CO2. Mm. So this is why carbon monoxide kills you right, because carbon monoxide will competitively bind to oxygen. So oxygen levels get low. Okay. But you don't sense that your oxygen's low, so you don't have any idea, and then you just fall dead. You pass out, or you're you, gone. oh wow. Because there's no elevation in CO2. Interesting. So this is why we have to put smells and things like that in various gases so that you can identify, have some so signal. you know, hey, this isn't good, I gotta get out. Or you have to have a carbon monoxide monitor in your house, wow. right? So point is, CO2 has a direct physical, psychological connection. This is a two-way street. It's what we call bi-directional. So an elevation or change in, say, state or trade anxiety. So the amount, like, you get something happened right now and you freaked out, bad text, real actual thing. It doesn't matter. You will see an acute change in CO2 levels. So if I think a thought, experience something that frightens me or may, gives me stress or anxiety, watch a scary movie, whatever it might be, your girlfriend reaches out to you about something and Doesn't you matter. feel stressed. What happens to the body when you feel that in a moment? You're gonna get an immediate change in catecholamine status. What is that? So you're gonna see adrenaline, you're gonna see epinephrine, which is same yeah. basic word. You're gonna see norepinephrine, cortisol, all these things, these, this stress response is gonna happen instantaneously. 
From that, you're going to see a physiological response. So you're going to see a change in heart rate. You're going to see a change in ventilation. You'll see a change in dilation of your eyes mm -hmm. and focus. You'll tend to see a ch actually change in vision uh, because you, you're going to want to narrow in right. what, what's the danger, what's the threat. So you have a whole host of physiological responses that are coming from a psychological stress. And it goes both ways. So a physical stress can also then cause a state of psychological awareness. So you can give yourself psychological anxiety from a change in physiology. Mm. Exercise. Right. CO2 starts to rise. Oh my gosh, you can't focus. You, you aren't making good decisions. Your vision changes. Everything happens in this bi-directional Interesting. Way. So with CO2, and we've seen this in our lab, if someone is very tolerant and resistant, which is where we started this, this question at, mm -hmm. to elevations in CO2. Meaning that they can push themselves longer distances from training, they can Not have even, it's, high it's, heart rate. It's simpler than that. What is it? Yeah, it's simply, say that bad thing happened yes. psychologically. Mm -hmm. You get this rise in CO2. If you're tolerant to that CO2, you can go, okay, I'm good here. Heart rate came up a little bit, not much. You can assess the situation. You can be more neutral as opposed to up and down. And it's, it's, that would be a psychological or cognitive thing, but there's also just physiological. Your heart rate won't go up as much. Mm -hmm. And you're, okay, we're good here. We're fine, right? You're not going to make any emotional decisions. Right. You're not going to make any physical actions. You're Re not going to change react. Yeah. your ventilation strategy. You're resilient to it, right? Someone who is sensitive to it has the smallest little thing come in, and they're gone. Right, right. the wreck. I. This is the people. These are the people who are. Oh, if I don't have my coffee in the morning, like don't talk to me. This, right. this like, <laughs> horribleness, right? Like we was like we call these people precious. You should be more sense. You should be more resilient uh -huh. to daily stressors. Yeah. But you should be fairly sensitive to things like I feel like I'm not drinking enough water today. Mm -hmm. I want a lot of sensitivity there because now you can quickly recognize change of behavior and pattern. Yes. But some stressors we want you to be resilient towards. I want you to be resilient towards running 20 miles. Yeah. Right? 26.2, but yeah, it's counting. But I want, you to, <laughs> I want you to be sensitive to going, hey, my heart rate's a little bit higher mm -hmm. last time that I ran this pace because now I don't need as much tech to give me feedback because right. that's, what, that's one of the problems with the tech, especially um, training and physiology-based technologies is they're outsourcing your own endogenous awareness. The heart rate monitor or something else. Totally, yeah. right, and this is what the, our entire Unplugged book was about. It, it's not that training tech is bad. Obviously, I use it with every professional athlete I work with. But you don't want to outsource your physiology to a clumsy tech. Mm -hmm. It can be good for calibration. It can be good for establishing, I don't know what a heart rate of 150 is. I have right, no idea. right, it's an assessment tool. It's more of like, where am I at? Totally. Not a continuum tool necessarily. 100%. Yeah, an assessment every now and then. Okay, let me recheck later. Yep. But using your brain or your body or your own senses to assess on a consistent basis is what I'm hearing is probably more yeah. in alignment to a healthier long-term constructive life. Absolutely, because then what happens when you're Michael Phelps and you're in the pool in the Olympics and you're like, I and need my money. <laughs> well, your goggles broke. Oh, yeah. And he still broke a world record. Yeah. The, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this story, but what happened is goggles break in the middle of the race, right? You can't see. Now, you know how important it is to be able to see when you're swimming, especially oh, yeah. when you're trying to break a world record because yeah. you can't veer, right? He finished it and the story goes, his coach had actually made him practice without his goggles mm -hmm. in case something to like prepare this happened. For it, yeah. So he learned how many strokes it takes, he learned how far he's traveling and he could just count and then he knew when to reach. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? So if we kind of wrap that part up is, if you think about the entire optimization, if you want to call it that for human physiology, you have to think, it's my position that the entire existence is a human race. We have strived for two primary goals, and that's it. Reproduce, right? The second one is m reduction of stress. Mm. We're now realizing, though, it worked. We have all these comforts, right? We went too far, right? We developed culture for safety in numbers, right? We developed agriculture for safety of food. We developed indoors for safety of thermal stress. And we've strove for one central goal. Every technological advancement we've ever done is to mitigate stress. Mm. Now what happens when you go into space and we have completely reduced all stress? Your physiology tanks in a matter of days. Wow. So getting to Mars is not gonna be a rocket problem. It's gonna be a physiology problem. Interesting. We can't replace enough stress. With our current lifestyles, 
your question initially, and I'm whatever, 10 minutes into finally answering your question. Why are we at these problems? It's simply because we have not realized what stressors we want to place on ourselves and which ones we're acceptable removing. Mm -hmm. We've just removed all as fast as we can. So if you want to take this from a lifestyle, if you want to take this from a happiness, if you want to take this from a movement or nutrition, any of these ones, are, it's going to work. Yeah. We have to have a better understanding of what are we trying to go after. So we have to come back and now artificially engage in weird stress, yes. like exercise. Yeah. Because it feels like, I think I can speak for most of the human race. And correct, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong here. It yeah. feels like most of the human race wants to be happy, wants to be healthy, sure. wants to have quality relationships and feel loved, yeah. wants to, and wants to live a longer life. They want to be around longer. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I'm off and tell me if I'm wrong. If that's, But I feel like most of humanity wants those things. I think you're probably pretty close. Right. And maybe they want to have status or something else or have a, you know, fulfillment in their, their work or something. But those are things. They want to be happy, healthy, quality relationships and extend their life as long as they can in a healthy way. Is it better to do that to live in complete comfort or what types of stresses do we need to be putting ourselves to also have all those things and extend our life as long as we can? Um, or if we're living in complete comfort, will we die earlier? Yeah, clearly. There's no doubt, right? So you're going to... And when it's too much stress, like you're actually going to die earlier because you're stressing yourself too much. This, isn't, this is what we do. Uh, this is the entire point of everything I do with a professional athlete, right? We're trying to assess what we'll call hidden stressors, uh -huh. visible stressors. We're going to match that with our recovery capacity, right? If you outkick your coverage, in other words, your hidden or visible stressors are higher than your recovery capacity, you're going to block adaptation. Okay. Right? Now, if I can move the lever on increasing your recovery capacity or I can reduce a stress, total stress load, fine. Well, the backside of that coin is the only way we get adaptation is through stress. So reduction of stress is adaptation, not What's adaptation? Any change. Okay. Any it's, change. The only way we grow is through stress. Or shrink. Interesting. Okay. Either way, right? It's going to have to be some stressor. Um, it's inertia. Mm -hmm. If I put a, if I throw a ball in space, it will continue at the same speed for forever because there's no external stress. Mm. We have external stress here. Physiology is optimized with stress. Right. Not without. The body is optimized with stress. Yeah. It functions its best with stress because it needs to continually provide maintenance. Imagine if in this building. You just fired every maintenance person. It's not going to work its best. Right. <laughs> you want to have some small changes there. Let's get the carpet out. Let's do this. Let's change out. You're going to see improvements, right? Mm -hmm. Take the trash out, everything, yeah. Totally, yeah. Right, that's a, like a figurative and a quite yeah. literal example. So another paradigm that's important to think about is what we'll call optimization versus adaptation. Okay. So just like I had my, and you're going to see this a lot, by the way. Like I love to have kind of numbers and, and systems. Every choice you're making in your day is moving you more towards optimization or adaptation. Mm -hmm. Now, what the key is, is understanding when we want to hedge for one versus the other. And I can give you some examples. If you um, had, like, say you spent some time and you figured out what your optimal morning routine is. Yeah. Awesome. I want people to do that. That's fantastic. Huge believer in understanding what makes you feel incredible. However... That's pushing towards optimization, right? So you're gonna not do work, you're gonna, um, you're gonna lose time in your day, you're gonna do all these things that yeah. are gonna come at an expense, and you're gonna feel great that day. The downside of that optimization is you're blocking adaptation, right? Because you're no longer getting better at dealing with a suboptimal day. Fine, so when you say, okay, look, I've got a very important meeting, I've got a game today, I've got something to do, I want you to know exactly what it takes for you to feel fantastic, starting 24 hours or more out. Let's get on this thing. Let's get in the sleep. Let's get everything mm -hmm. dialed. I'm going to feel great tomorrow. Yes. If you try to practice that every single day, you're going to become incredibly sensitive. Which means if something's if off. Anything is off. You just tank. Oh, interesting. So you have the optimal routine, but if your alarm clock goes off too soon, or you get a phone call, or something happens and you wake up, dog wakes you up in the middle of the night. Now the whole day is off. Is the what whole you're saying. thing is screwed. 
Interesting. Because you became <clears throat> way too sensitive. So I want you to you have... You became too reliant on it being perfect in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this a lot with breathwork stuff. Where people are just like, if I don't get my whole breathwork in, like I can't focus. Mm. If I don't have my nootropic and I don't have my full... Like, that's not... If you can't function without coffee... That's not good. And caffeine's fantastic. Yeah. Like, that's a really bad position to be in because you're back to being precious now. Yeah. If anything happens... You're not resilient. I can't take you in the woods. We can't go hunting for five days because you're not going to be able to... Function. Plug in yeah. your head. <laughs> app, like, like, no. Yeah. Like, we need to be able to survive in mm. difficult situations. Huh. Obviously, our lives, what we consider to be a difficult situation now is far less than what it on average used to be. Yeah. Um, certainly, some people are dealing with like really difficult things. But for the most part, as a global average in this country, the bar has gone up. Life, uh -huh. life is pretty good. Yeah, we're not in the woods all day. Yeah. So how do we figure this out? We need to think through from an athletic perspective. It's very easy, right? In the off season, for example, we're not driving optimization. I'm not peaking you for tomorrow uh -huh. when I'm six months out from a game. I'm driving adaptation. Here's what that means. You're not going to feel great today. Things aren't going to be perfect. Um, our HRV numbers are going to be down. Our, I'm not going to give you an optimal pre and post workout. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to dial these things in. We're going to put the body under higher stress in the areas we want. We're yeah. going to remove them in the areas we don't want. But general stress load is going to go up. And I may, Interesting. I may cut out a little bit of your recovery capacity. Make it uncomfortable for you. I want yeah. you to become more resilient. I want the, the physiological requirements for recovery to have to go, we don't have enough here. Upregulate, mm. build more mitochondria, be more tolerant to um, the connective tissue, be more tolerant to the stress load, mm -hmm. whatever thing we're trying to push. Yeah, you're going to feel more soreness today, you have to push through the soreness, whatever, yeah. All these things, right? Now, we're going to roll into season in this example and say, let's now push towards optimization. And I, I could give you some examples of this, mm -hmm. but we've done work with things like taper. And, and you know what taper is, but I'll explain for non-sport folks. Like tapering off? Yeah. Yeah. So you've trained the entire season, yeah. for example, and then the last couple of weeks you say back down practices. Yeah, so we can get ready for the playoffs. The whole idea is you've actually overloaded your system the entire season. Mm -hmm. And now when you back off that volume, intracellularly you recover. Mm -hmm. So now performance jumps up. And we've seen this actually. We've taken biopsies of folks uh, pre and post like a three-week taper. And we've seen improvements of like 10 to 15% in fast twitch muscle size. Wow. Through the taper. Wow. And how long is the taper? Like a Three weeks. A couple weeks, yeah. And we've seen this with as little as two. And this is now like a generally a 50% reduction in volume. So if you're running 30 miles a week and you go down to 15 for a week, you could quite literally see a giant increase in fast twitch muscle fiber size by simply doing less. Wow. That only works though because you worked really hard yes. before that. For like three months. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you just have to have a bit of a strategy. Yes. And for not like non-athletes, the same thing happens for this longevity scheme, right? Mm. So what you're trying to run the equations on all the time are, okay, what have I become really sensitive to? And what have I become really resilient against? And am I driving too much optimization? Because if you are, mm. you're probably shortcutting your long-term. It's what we call the short game versus the long game. So sometimes I want you to play the short game. Um, I don't want you to spend too much time pushing for, uh, another way to kind of think about this adaptation versus optimization is immediate versus delayed gratification. Yeah. If you always choose immediate gratification, I don't need to explain to you why that's mm -hmm. a problem. However, if you always choose delayed gratification, you're, you're now asking a recipe for mental health issues. Mm. Give me an example why. You're not present. Mm -hmm. You have this big thing and congratulations, like you, you made the big sale. Okay, yeah, but we now like we got to, you're always kicking the, mm -hmm. you're never having that piece of cake. You're never taking that day off. You're never present. Mm. And you've probably had a million people on the show before talk about the importance of presence, right? If you're worried mm -hmm. about the past, yeah. you know what that is. If you're worried about the future, that's a different thing. So having some semblance of presence is critical. So you want to pay attention to, hey, you haven't been happy. Um, I've had this happen with athletes Winning Olympic gold medals. Yeah, and then depression right after. Immediate depression, yeah. right? I, I can't Have tell you Have you seen that, that movie, The Weight of Gold? No. It's a documentary called The Weight of Gold. Yep, I you get should, it. You should watch it. It's, it's powerful. It's a, and it's about kind of like the depression cycle that these elite athletes have after the Olympics, specifically with the Olympics. Because, it's very real. Because it's like you train for eight or 16 years for 
one moment and then there's no more vision, there's no more goal once you retire, I guess. So it's even more acute than that. Yeah. You I have seen this before. Like you walk off and you have these NBA world championships, UFC mm-hmm. belts, and it's like I'm not even happy right now. Yeah. Or like it's the, not next, even like I'm the next day it's like You're not yeah. even happy right then. Yeah. And that's because it's too much of like, okay, yeah, yeah, we had a great day, but like or you focus on the mistakes you made, or I could have done this, or I missed, I missed the shot of the goal, or totally. whatever. Yeah, that's workaholics. Like yeah. you're, gonna, you're gonna have all these problems if you're too focused on acute happiness, though. Yeah, you're eating sugar all day long. You're having, you know, <laughs> you're not sleeping. You're just partying all day. Yeah, I'll probably, I'll, four or five hours work today is probably good. Like, yeah. Now you're, you're there. So all these things are calculation you're running, and I think you can challenge these with every aspect of your day, whether that's your work, it's your food. It's your relationships. All of these things you need to think carefully and go, you know what? Maybe I should, uh, I'm going to invest in more sleep right now, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to eat it with my job right now. Yeah. Um, we, we have what we call a snapshot or a quadrant. So you get 10 points. Give me an example. I give you 10 points. I'm going to make you do this right now. Okay. You ready for this? Um, you have four categories. Mm-hmm. Category one is relationships. Okay. So this is like a four quadrant? Bingo. Bingo. Okay. Relationships. Category two is physical. Category three is recovery. Okay. And category four um, is you know, we have relationships, we have physical recovery, and um, business. Of course, business like business life, like job, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So now each one of these categories is changing based on you. So what mm-hmm. relationship means to you? Like that's not the same for me. Whatever. Right. What's business mean? That's just, so. Whatever these things need to make sense for you, makes sense for you. And you get 10 points. Okay. So the question, and this is part of one through 10. Assessment. One through 10 total. So you got to tell me how many points you want to put in every category. You only have 10 total points. 10 total points. In each category or all? Total. Okay. So what, what's the points mean? Like how much of your energy are you going to put into each one of these for the next, let's say, eight weeks? And I like to do these in short seasons, right? So it could be a month, but I like eight weeks better. So right now for the next eight weeks, Lewis, how many points are you going to put in your relationships? I mean, I feel like I put a lot of my relationships. I feel so, like I put a lot in all these, okay, though. Put a, put a, put a, you, you get mean, 10. You only get 10 so if I give nine here, max. then I only get zero. Your 10 may be higher than my 10, uh-huh. right? But your 10 is still your, your max capacity. Sure, sure, sure. So I can only use 10 points in all, mm-hmm. total. So you know three, 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 four. And now what's that number? Oh, so three, 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 one, right? It's like... Bingo. Here's the problem. So put them down. Let's start with uh, recovery. I mean, I, don't know. I mean, it's like it's hard. I mean, so how much are you doing for physical and mental recovery every single day? I Relative feel, to look, let's start with business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is how a, much of your day is focused around business-related things. You're saying like there's 24 hours in a day. How much of your energy, your it overall, it's not like time per se. It's gotcha. like, how much does it take from your soul? I feel like uh, this is probably a four. Four, great. So now we got six points left across the next three categories. Uh-huh. How much is your physical training, your exercise, your breath work, your motor, your mobility? This is probably a, a two, one, 1.5. Can I no do that or not? Okay, I'll do a two. All right, so now you've got, how much are you putting into your relationships? This could be family. This, this could be probably, even your people you work with and, and building. This is probably a three and then a one. Right. All right, cool, fine. So here's what I'd say. There's nothing wrong. Your split is your split. Yeah. Here's what I'd say is, is that split matching your current goals? Well, I mean. And here's the thing. Yeah. Physical to recovery can never be higher than a two to one ratio. So you can't have a four in physical training and a one in recovery. Uh-huh. So this is perfect it. then. This is perfect. <laughs> two if, to one. If you don't want to make much progress in your physical training. Because you're right, only giving 20%. Percent. Right. Well, I'm thinking about the time. like. I spend an hour, two hours a day of my time towards physical training, nutrition, I guess, yeah. But like, so that's up to you, right? So right, right. what we're going to do then is we're going to take that and we're going to put that in front out here with the rest of your team. And you're mm-hmm. going to put that on your cell phone, right? And every couple of hours, we're going to check in and say, Lewis, did you, you haven't done, you, you skipped your mobility again today. Mm-hmm. Are we really getting two here? Are we getting half as much time in your physical training as we are in your business? And the answer is no. You're not holding consistently mm-hmm. against what you said. And this was our agreement. Mm-hmm. Right? You made this agreement to your boyfriend, right, you right, right. To mom, whoever your coach is, right? 
So we're, we're helping understand, and then we're going to do this again. And, and, and you may say, hey, look, right now, like we got this stuff moving business-wise. Yeah, right. So put more energy here as opposed to, yeah. It's just acknowledging it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's hugely helpful for the high performers yes. because we want your family to see this too. And so when you go, hey, look, we're in the playoffs right now. Um, I'm not going to have time for you. I'm gonna Dad's be going six in, in physical, yeah, going yeah. four in recovery. <laughs> yeah, and not the zero. <laughs> I, have, I have athletes that do this. It's like they're 10 weeks out and they hug their family and, okay, like Dad is going to see you in 10 weeks. Yeah. They're not moving out, but like, they're focused. And they know emotionally I'm, I'm going to try to be here, but it's just not going to yeah. be there. And if there's a question of like, can you go to Tommy's practice versus go see your, like you go in the, that yeah. choice is made. Right. And we're just going to hold you consistent to that choice. And it's very helpful for understanding mm -hmm. where we're going to go. However, the final key here is once you've hit that mark, we have to reassess and we mm -hmm. have to go, look, you can't just have a permanent six on business. No. It's not, you're, you're going well, to Well, this is what I love. Here, right? I loved, I love, uh, looking at life in seasons, just from like sports, I'm, you know, as an athlete, it's like yeah, you can too. never have a season nonstop forever. There's always an end to a season and then there's the postseason or the off season, whatever you want to call it. And then there's yeah. a preseason and then there's a season and then there's the playoffs. So it's yeah. like that end of the season, you got to give yourself a date when the end will 100%. be. So you can reassess and say, is this working for me? Do I still want to be doing this? Do I want to try something new in my life? And, and create a new vision for the next season of your life, which I think is valuable. I, I couldn't agree more because yeah. if not, you end up getting this and this. Like by the way, this is the most common split. Yeah. By f like eighty percent of people are going to put this on their first yeah. try. Exactly that. Yeah. I could actually. I probably, probably should have done like a magic trick before. Yeah. So I would guess he's going to go four, three, two, one. Like, yeah, yeah. It's everyone. Right? <laughs> um, if you run that the rest of your life, you're just going to continue to move at a very slow rate. Uh -huh. You have to come and go. Okay, you know what? Look, we did spend the next six months. We built this company. Uh -huh. We got this project. Yeah, because it takes momentum to build something and launch something. It's no going to take question. more effort and time on one thing. But then you got to focus back on your body. Or, or the goal would be hopefully to have things kind of balanced after you launch things, right? No, or no? not really. Huh. I don't think because if you end up having an equal balance of everything, you get very little done. Uh -huh. I actually like sprints. Totally. I haven't slept and we went nuts for two months, whatever the thing is. I'm going to go full recovery. We're going to go to business and maybe we're going to do it for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Fine. And you, you know take what? a month off or yeah. not a month, not even a month. It could just be like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to work from 11 a.m. to two. I'll work three right, hours a right, day, right. whatever the case is. And it's just not going to get done. We're going to lose that sale. We're going to like, money's going to come down 20%. Fine. Mm -hmm. But I have to repay back this physical debt. We have to pay this yeah. emotional debt back. Mm -hmm. I got to spend time with my relationship debt. I haven't yeah, called my stuff. mom yet back. Like it's, I'm going to hate myself when if, all these things you know are true. You just have to now invest and go. Because, like, I know. Like, I know you have to just do the 100-hour work week sometimes. Uh-huh. Yeah. If you're launching something. If you want it to be successful. You have to. You can't just show up two hours a day on a business that no one knows about. When we're preparing for it. world title fights or four yeah. years into an Olympic quad, there are plenty of times when it is just, like, nothing else is going yeah, on. Yeah, you, you don't even get to call your mom. No, just kidding. <laughs> she gets one minute a day. Go to cabin. No mom, no well, kids. Here's the thing. Here's, the, here's one thing I want to ask you about is um, sleep. You know, one yep. of the things that I've heard from a lot of the sleep scientists and doctors out there from, you know, Dr. Matthew Walker to Huberman to yep. Sean Stevenson, who studied a lot about this as well, um, is that you can't pay off sleep debt is what I've heard. Like, if you're you know, two hours behind on sleep, what you should be getting, the brain just functions slower from what I've been told by scientists. And if you keep doing two hours less every day or you only get four hours or five hours of sleep, like the body is not going to be able to recover. You're going to be slower thinking based on the studies that they've done. So what have you seen where if people are lacking sleep, are able to still be focused and recover? And can you pay off that debt if you miss a few hours every week for years, can your body actually recover? Um, it's a bit of a pedantic argument. Okay. Um, my general response is, I like the message of, no, I'll just like sleep when I'm like, I hate that idea. No, sleeping I'm dead, yeah. No, 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 like you're going to be you're dead. You're gonna die sooner. It, it's no good, right? So I, as a general thing, I think it's a good message to put the like, hey, you need to invest in your physical health and sleep is a huge cornerstone to that. Having said that, I think people, and these are not Matthew Walker's words, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's just what people have interpreted, as Sim was saying. There is some confusion on what sleep debt in, is and is not. So if you missed two hours of sleep last night, that's not two hours. Well, you can't travel back in time. 
Yeah. So yes, technically you'll never recover those two hours. Like literally not going to happen. Totally get it. But don't think because you've not slept two hours tonight that you'll never recover some physical state ever possible again. Mm -hmm. That's not sleep debt. What he's saying is you can't sleep three hours a night during the week and then sleep 15 on the weekends and think that that's equal. Mm -hmm. That's a bad idea. So I would absolutely agree with the, the idea of sleep debt like that is something you want to avoid. Um, I would also agree that if you want to perform cognitively and physically at your highest level, sleep should be a major core. Mm -hmm. I would probably argue the top. That's why I've spent so much time in that area. So I'm a huge proponent of that. I'm a big believer in it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I deal with athletes that are, take a major league baseball player. We're going to go into different time zones. Right. Every three or four days. Yeah, right? it's tough. Um, we, we, we have to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. And so we have to come up with solutions for that. And we do. Mm -hmm. um, you can recover. Yeah. Like, there's no question. You can come back to baseline. Um, it, it's a question of this. Think about your body tends to like spikes versus slow ramps. So what I mean by that is a huge insult physiologically matched with an equal amount of recovery tends to lead to positive adaptations. A tiny when you bit mean of stress. An in, when you mean an insult, a huge insult, meaning like, okay, I'm going to the gym, I'm hitting it hard for a couple hours, I'm going to tear the muscles to a certain point. Yeah, and there's actually not much muscle tearing there, but I'm gonna you get the Be idea. sore. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be sore. I'm going yeah. to be in pain, right? Okay. And then uh, I'm going to go to fatigue, whatever it is. And so you're saying a big insult in the body. Yeah. Stress. A, a totally important point that you don't care about. I promise I won't lose the message. Here. Yes. You do not need to get sore for a quality workout at all. For a quality workout. For have a, a productive exercise session, soreness is a terrible metric okay. of productivity. Um, we can come back to that if you want, but I don't yes. want to lose what you're really trying to get at because that was just yes. a, kind of yes, an example yes. you were saying. So I understand. Um, so we can flag that and come back if yeah. you want. Um, but yes, in theory, whether this is a, a food insult, whether this is a sleep insult, whether this is a hormonal it is a thermal stress. This is why things like cold, cold, hot, hot yeah. They are big, whole oh, cow. We're gonna see a, a change in ventilation. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see an endocrine response, which is hormone release, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna see all these physiological changes. Um, this is what we're after. We if want that. You match it with an equal amount of rigor recovery. Sleep, rest. Done, right? You yeah. get in a cold bath, um, 30 degree water. You're gonna see immediate, <gasps> Boom, everything is yes. gonna shoot up. You're gonna get out what you're gonna see. In fact, if you look at like HRV. So HRV is a measure of autonomic nervous system. So this is, um, think of this as like a global measure of your stress load, okay? Now there's the, the parasympath parasympathetic side of the equation, which is kind of like chill, and then sympathetic, which is like fight or flight. So you want this high HRV score, because this is generally saying you are in a nicely parasympathetic mode when you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. If you get in the ice, and we've done this with a lot of professional athletes, not like one setting, we're talking about like weeks and weeks of daily and metrics and months of metrics, your HRV score when you get in the ice is going to plummet. It's, you're gonna flip into sympathetic nervous system uh -huh. as fast, and remember, low HRV is bad. Okay. You get out of the ice, within 30 minutes, your HRV score will be higher than it was when you started. 60, 90, 180 up to 270 minutes post that, it'll still be higher than it was at the beginning. So a three minute jump in cold water can provide a pretty lasting positive physiological response. And that's mm, exactly what I mean by short term shock matched by get out, okay, breathe. Relax for 20 minutes, yeah. Totally. You're going to see a higher basal state if you want to think about it, than you, what you did before. That's a, a really easy example of a quick. Higher base state of what? In this particular case, HRV, which is a, again, a, a, like a rough global metric of what's your physiological state. And you want that, you want it to be higher. You're higher. Yeah. You're performing it's better. better. You're more under control. Interesting. So less. Is, is that good to do on a daily basis, these short shocks, whether it be extreme hot, extreme cold, extreme whatever? you know, extreme sprinting really quick, something like that, yeah, it can on a be, daily or? Yeah, I think so. Oh. Um, but they don't have to be the same thing. So you uh -huh. don't have to ice every day. You don't have to do max heart rate intervals every day. Mm -hmm. um, but you could do something that requires tremendous concentration. Mm -hmm. 
focus. You, you yeah. can make a get like yeah. I'm gonna do 90 minutes of just completely involved work. I'm gonna do a meditation session. I'm mm, gonna breath work. I'm gonna be totally engaged with my partner and just really have a 45 minute conversation where we're just locked like physical touch. All of these things can represent these short mm, intense bursts, mm. right? So if you're an exerciser like like us, like that's gonna come a lot of times yeah. in the form of working out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, food related things. There, there there's of course, supplementation and, and other areas, areas to get to it. What you don't want is just a wandering baseline where you're like slightly underslept, you're slightly overfed, mm. like you have a little bit of stress, but it's not like the kind of stress you want. No, it's not good stress. It's like... You're not totally focused and then like work builds up and then like you're kind of a jerk to your kid. That's, that's a recipe for all things bad, right? Mm -hmm. Loss of productivity, loss of relationships, all these things got worse and we didn't drive adaptation. So we didn't get better. Interesting. Because of it. So those are the areas we want to stay away from. Um, you could, you could, I could give you physiological examples, but you're getting the point, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that's where we want to be mindful of. With sleep, for example, chronic slight under sleep is, is going to lead to that area of, okay, like I just, now all of a sudden, I don't feel great and I feel like my energy's down and we just have these continual degradation of physiological state. So then we have to come in and mm -hmm. spend way too much time running diagnosis and figure out, okay, is this, it's one of four, bad sleep is one of four areas. It's psychology, it is physiology, it is environment, or it is um, your pathology. What is pathology? So you could have something going on, um, like if we ran, you could have, um, there's, a, there's a particular issue where your legs twitched all night, right? You have um, things like that where, where uh, your tongue is falling in the back of your neck and you can't breathe and you're being shot awake. So some sort mm -hmm. of negative uh, actual state, you could have some sort of physical induced sleep apnea. Right. So the four parts of bad sleep is psychology, which is essentially like the way you're, maybe you're thinking or ruminating all day, or worrying about something and you're not able to calm your thoughts, yeah. essentially. This, this, this comes into a variety of areas. Either I can't turn my brain off at night. Yeah. This is this like, used to be me for most of my life. Totally. Yeah. Super easy fixes for that, by the way, for the most part. <sighs> I wish I had that. Well. <laughs> I, okay. feel like I, had, I feel like I had that in the environment. We didn't have air conditioning when I was a kid growing up. Yeah, me So I was just sweating in the middle of the summer, just like, I can't sleep. And then you're just like ruminating on why he can't sleep. Totally. <laughs> no sheets, no blankets, just like, uh, and my dad didn't let me have a fan on me because like, it's gonna make you sick. <laughs> you know, just oh, like, no way. Yeah, so I couldn't have a fan on. And he was like, this is gonna make you sick. <laughs> So I just had to sit there like for two hours every night, like hoping well, to sleep. Well, you became very resilient to I know, high right? <laughs> oh my gosh, man. So I feel like the psychology, the yeah. environment is one thing. And yeah, you hear so people talking about having a sleep sanctuary and really like the different things you can do with dark out, uh, yeah, so the, the snake plants to create more oxygen, the, yeah. the sheets, the temperature, everything for the optimized sleep is the key, right? So yeah, the, so, so the with, with the environment, you want to pay attention to a handful of other things. Most people are hip to light. Yeah, the light is sound, right? Yeah. But there's other things that we can measure, like we were, I was talking before the show. All right, we have a box that we can just sit in the end of your desk. Oh, I like that. And it's going to run full environmental diagnostics. I want to try that. So this is going to measure everything from like your CO2 cloud, which is, again, going back to our beginning of our conversation, you're going to take a breath in and you're going to breathe out CO2. Well, when you're sleeping, that, because you're not going, right, you're just barely moving. So that CO2 basically seeps out. Wow. Well, if that CO2 hovers around your face and you're re-inhaling CO2, what's happening? It's not good. It's going right back up again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> shooting awake, or even if you're not physically shooting awake, you're gonna be shot out of sleep stages, mm. all right, which is what we're trying to get into, right? And you can go back to, I'm sure, listen to your episodes with Walker and, yes. and Andrew, and they've talked about the very sleep stages. Mm -hmm. So if we can figure out, hey, you know what? Like, actually, it's not, you don't need to wear the blue blockers, not right. that you don't, but like, you don't right. have all these things that people are thinking, Screens, you've tried everything. all these supplementation, you've tried changing your diet, you've changing all these things, you're done, and you're still not sleeping, well, maybe it's as simple as the fact that the air ventilation in your room oh. isn't moving the air off your face. Oh. So having some circulation. Totally. It has to be yes. the right type of circulation because if the air conditioner goes, back. Yeah, yeah. now we've fallen. Sorry if that was really loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's falling actually, now back into there. Yeah, I actually like the, uh, some sound, like not sound, but more like, 
uh, oh, airflow, yeah. airflow, like hearing the, 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 the air flowing makes me sleep easier than silence. Like yeah. I get like worried when it's just silent. I don't know. Uh, you're, you're very normal. Yeah. Most people are going to say, <laughs> put a bit, this way white noise machine. Like work, a little right? fan or something. Yeah. Just to hear totally, like, right. Shh. It also drowns out the bottom level of noise. That's true. Any other little sounds that you might hear from the outside. Yeah. That's interesting. Can't hear it. Right. Huh. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at any. You said pathology. What was the third one? Psychology, environment, something else in pathology. Uh, physiology. Physiology. This is like. So this is where we're going to measure. Your body's twitching or you're sore, you're in pain. No, no. This is no. going to be quite literally uh, your melatonin levels throughout the night before. Gotcha. Throughout the day. It's cortisol levels. It's DHEA levels. It's everything that goes, the phys serotonin, dopamine. Um, all these things that you can do supplementation-wise or food-wise are affecting the physiology. So what we're going to try to do is run through if you do the very standard sleep hygiene stuff and that's not working. Now we've got to go down one of these, these areas steps, and yeah. figure out maybe there's simply a pollen, pollen, a pollen or some environmental mm -hmm. thing going on in the air mm. that's blocking up your nose and all of a sudden you can't breathe through your nose. Now you've gone to mouth breathing at yeah. night and you've probably talked about that a bunch of course. Of yeah, yeah. Why that's bad. James um, Nestor. Yeah. Yeah, you can look at the nitric oxide issues, so endothelial functions down. So if you're a little bit older and you've lost nitric oxide function mm. and or you're not getting high nitric oxide concentrations out of your food. And now if you've got the double whammy, which tends to happen, poor food and age, Boom. Like now we have physiological problems. So it may not be any of the environment or psychology, but you're kicking awake. And then when you kick awake, you start thinking and now you yes. think it's a psychology problem, but really your physiology was just too close to high alert. Mm -hmm. And any little thing shot you off. And so you weren't resilient at all because you're right on that threshold um, of not being able to do things. And then you can try, you know, I'm sure Andrew's talked about HSRD stuff and just like nuts, right? Uh, another trick I love for the brain thing, actually, we use this a lot with high performers. And, and by that, I mean not just athletes, but high performers, right? Executives and yeah. The brain does not do well for these people that are high drive when you tell it to calm down. Now, if you can't do that, you need to develop that skill. The ability to calm down. For sure. At any moment, yeah. And meditation, breath work, all uh -huh. this stuff is really effective. However, it tends to do very well when you simply give it a very specific task, which sounds counterintuitive. So you should awake and you can't go back to sleep because you're thinking about whatever the thing is. Um, two ways to solve this. Number one, if it's like, I got to do this tomorrow and this, this, this is a very easy solution is to just keep this right by your bed. Mm -hmm. Wake up and write, okay, boom, 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 boom. And you'll be like, all right, I'm good. Get it out, so, yeah. Or the other way is I try to solve my hardest problems in bed when I can't sleep. I specifically, not my emotionally difficult ones, but my hardest, what I call wonders. Thought like, you know, I haven't really thought through this concept of optimization. Like, how would this, and I'm just, I'm thinking really hard on something. How am I going to write, the, like, you know, like, what do those data mean? Like, huh? gone. Because you've just, you you've, fall asleep. you've state changed. Mm. You've given the brain a task, and then it goes, whoa, 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 like, this is not what we're doing right now. Boom. Really interesting. And you just go out. Oh. So mindfulness is my number one. Try to just zen back out. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, though, focus on a task that's not emotionally charging for you. Oh, uh, yeah. But you really like. What's the thing that you're just like, man, sometimes... Like sometimes I'll think about, I'm a sports fan, I right? played college football like you. Sometimes I think about like, God, can I name the entire 1995 Mariners roster? <laughs> like, I think I can. Who do I play second base? Like, I wanna, yeah. like, you just go through that stuff. So you give it something to do. Yeah. It's the same thing with like a, a parenting or working with employees, rather than just telling them what not to do. Yeah. You're more effective generally telling it what to do and making it do something mm -hmm. and giving it options. Hey, right. you can think about this, this, or this. I'm not just going to run out and say, no, 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 no. Because that's really hard for you to just like stop thinking about this damn meeting. Like that's just, that's really difficult right, to right. do. Right, right. It doesn't work. So yeah. you know what? Okay, you can have these three options. Think about this, this, or this. And you just mm -hmm. go. And at worst case, you lay there in bed happy. Yes. <laughs> thinking about something, yeah. Worst case. Um, something I've heard recently from different longevity experts is that building muscle mass is one of the key indicators to living a longer life. 
don't know if that's accurate in your studies it's or what. You, accurate. Yeah, so having you know, for a number of reasons, if you fall and like just to be able to get yourself off the ground so you don't die is one one thing. Having the strength, also yeah. just like being healthier and living longer and more flexible and stuff like well, that. Well, there's physiology too. Remember, skeletal muscle is your biggest organ, uh -huh. which means it's your center house for most of your hormone response. It's going to control and regulate a lot of physiology. It's your it's the place where insulin is going to have the most effect. Mm. Um, your cytokines and myokines, most of this is coming in or out of muscle. It's an amino acid reserve, slightly, mm -hmm. um, which you need amino acids to then build immune cells and brain cells. Everything else requires an amino acid. So it's a storage depot. Um, it has tremendous physiological benefit outside of jumping mm. and looking good. Um, is this the same for men and women? Yes. So should no women question. be thinking about building muscle? 100%. If you look very clearly at the longevity data, you're going to see a handful of things jump out. Um, if you look at studies, and this is Stephen Blair stuff from 1990, and way back we've known that things like your VO2 max, um, and, and this is something that, again, it's been every, in every exercise physiology textbook mm. for 35 years, right? It's nothing new, so it's not like a controversial hot new thing. It's like very well established. VO2 max is a huge predictor of longevity, lifespan and, and health span. Um, more recently, but even the last 20 years, muscle function, so muscle size and muscle quality. In fact, a, a really nice review paper came out just this week, Journal of Physiology, um, showing that skeletal muscle cells, so remember, your muscle, um, any one of your muscles is made up of millions of individual muscle cells. So think about a ponytail. So a ponytail is one, but it's oh, just a composite tons of, of hairs. tons of hair. Skeletal muscle is long and thin, and tube. And in fact, it's one of the biggest cells in all of biology by volume. Mm. So human skeletal muscle is massive. It's multinucleated, which is also very unique, which means all your DNA is held in the nucleus. Mm. Of the muscle. Of the cells, of every cell. That's just yes. how cells work. Most cells have one nucleus per cell. Skeletal muscle has thousands. Mm. And now you imagine having a muscle cell this long, right? And you can see them with your naked eye. You can. Uh, I've got stuff where uh, I can pull it up with a tweezer and hold it up in air, and you can see a muscle cell with your naked eye. Wow. We've done that before. Um, in that thing, it could be a few inches long, it's going to have thousands of nuclei spread throughout it. And what this does is allow you tremendous adaptability. So imagine you're running a company all over the nation. Um, if you had one manager and there's a branch in Wisconsin and there's a branch in Florida and a printer breaks in Wisconsin and they got to call you, mm -hmm. or you could have a general manager in every single location. Repair happens much faster, which means we can have more turnover, mm -hmm. we can accept more jobs, we can then do more stress. We mm -hmm. can handle more stress, right? In fact, we've seen this in some of our athletes, um, that the ones who recover faster and handle the more volume have more of these mitochondria. Mm -hmm. or, sorry, have more of these myonuclei. So, the nucleation is what allows you to handle and recover from stress because it's controlling your DNA. It's coming in and saying, we've had an insult here. Reproduce um, the genes necessary to build the protein, in this case, myosin or actin, the proteins that make muscles contract or more, whatever the case is, yeah. right, it's gonna build. So you have these greater amount of, of, um, of control there. So having more and higher quality muscle function just simply allows you to go through more physical stress. More physical stress then has tangential benefits to the cardiovascular system, mm -hmm. bone system, um, uh, brain, like everything else is gonna then benefit from your ability to continue to put yourself through physical stress. You're going to feel better. Um, one of the key associates of muscle strength and size through time is general physical activity. So imagine standing up out of this chair is an 85% one rep max. You're not gonna do it very often. No. <laughs> so by having strong legs in particular for men and women means you're much more likely to get up and go check the mail, get up and go for the walk, which means general physical activity goes up and we have all those secondary benefits mm -hmm. associated. So it is hugely important. And the last thing I'll say here is not only is it important for general muscle, but it is incredibly important to preserve your fast twitch muscle fibers. How do you do that? You need to expose them to stress, which means you need to make them move forcefully. Mm. That's the central place. So think about it this way. You've got these millions of muscle fibers inside a muscle. Some of them are what we call fast twitch, which means they, cur they contract with a lot of velocity, but they tend to be fatigable. Mm. So they use primarily or mostly carbohydrates for fuel and less fat and less mitochondria. Great. Their purpose is explosion, force production. Then you have a bunch of slow twitch fibers. 
and they're the opposite. So they don't contract with much velocity. They mm -hmm. tend to be smaller, but not always. Uh, but they tend to have a lot more mitochondria. So these are, um, these are your anti-gravity muscles. So your spinal erectors are mostly slow twitch because they're supposed to be on, lightly contracted, and just keeping you erect. Your hamstrings are fast twitch muscles. You don't need your hamstrings very often, but you need them to explode, right? So each person has a different amount of fast twitch and slow twitch muscles, and they differ from muscle to muscle based on mm -hmm. functionality, mm -hmm. right? Even within like the calf, there's two primary muscles, the soleus and a gastroc. Soleus is keeping you vertical, and a gastroc is the one that, like, if you flex your toe towards your face, yeah. it's the one that pops out in the inside. Yeah. That's explosion. So what happens is general activities of daily living are always going to activate slow twitch fibers, right? So when I take a drink of this yeah. cup... You're not sprinting. Yeah. You're not I'm jumping. I'm actually not activating any fast twitch muscle fibers yeah. because if I did, I wouldn't be able to downregulate force production. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with what's the least amount of force needed so we call the size principle. So Eldwood Henneman, famous neuroscientist, 1950s. He said, there's this idea that you're gonna activate the low threshold neurons first, right? So you're scratching your arm, you're uh -huh. doing this, right? I'm gonna activate the smallest, weakest nerve set. And if you realize I need more force here, you'll activate a little bit bigger. And you need more force, we'll go a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger until that's enough, right? Well, these fast twitch fibers at the higher threshold Imagine going years and now decades of never turning them on because you never did anything that required high force production. Well, eventually those they turn off. die. Yeah. They, they die. You're not, you don't have fast twitch anymore. You can't sprint, you can't jump, you can't the, lift heavy it's, things. It's the nerve that stops sending signals. Mm. The muscle fiber can die away and go or it can stay there. But the nerve then says, you know what? Um, we we're gonna re innervate and grab some of these fast twitch fibers and convert them into slow twitch. And uh, so you have these huge swaths of slow twitch fibers. Interesting. You can't produce force. And so once those are dead, it's, it's gonzo, right? Wow. Regrowing a nerve, is, a nerve is, is, is out of there. What's the best ways to... Anything that requires high force. High force meaning... Anything that feels lifting, kind of heavy. Lifting heavy. It can be jumping, can be plyometrics, uh, it can be... Um, start where you're at. So yeah. don't go to the gym if you haven't lifted in 10 years. Start and squatting 300 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> start with simple movements. Yeah. Start with single joint machines mm -hmm. if you have to. I don't care. And then what's heavy? Well, what feels heavy? Okay, great. Next time, a little more, a little mm -hmm. more. And, and stay in movement patterns yeah. that are efficient and get a little bit sore is okay, but pushing more soreness is not equivalent for better. Really? Not why is Why is... Could you improve without getting sore? Uh, uh, yeah, it's like my whole job. Really? Yeah. So when when does soreness happen? When it's like, the, okay, you're, if you so, do this much, you won't feel sore, but if you go one rep more, you're gonna feel sore. Yeah, a couple of things to note there. People tend to explain soreness as micro tears in muscle fibers. Uh -huh. That can happen, but that's not the primary reason. Um, most likely you're disturbing, this is like probably way outside of your audience interest level. You're disturbing calcium concentrations in, from the sarcoplasm and particular to the muscle fibers. Um, so it's not a muscle damage, although that can occur. The things that tend to make you more sore are the eccentric portion. So this is the lowering of stuff. So imagine if you were to do a bench press and you lowered it to your chest, that's eccentric. That's gonna cause more damage than the part where you lift Pushing it, it off yeah. your chest. Yeah. So if you're doing a lot of eccentric related movements- You're gonna get more sore. More sore. Interesting. But you're gonna get stronger too. So if you're doing a pull up when you go down and slowly, that's when you're gonna feel sore. But you're so gonna make you stronger. You, yes. So how do you get stronger without soreness? Control volume. So how many reps you do? It totally depends on the person. So you gotta figure this out, right? What's the reps I can do? What's the load I can do? And what's the movement pattern? And then how frequently can I do this where, here's my rule of thumb. If you grade soreness on a scale of one to 10. Like I can't walk as a 10. Totally. If you go to a zero, you're probably in a place where you didn't cause enough stress. No stress, no adaptation. Mm -hmm. If you go 10. You can't move. You've gone so far in that direction. I hurt yourself, <laughs> yeah. Most definitely, but also think about it. You're not gonna be able to train again very soon. For four or five days, you can't, you're not gonna function. Worse, Yeah. right? And you're gonna stop moving, you're gonna do all these things. Mm -hmm. And so you actually have killed your own mm -hmm. productivity. Mm -hmm. Three. That's Three where four. you wanna be. And when does soreness usually occur the, the, curve, the next day or two days later? It, it depends on the person. Okay. It's gonna be anywhere in that 
Yeah. It's what we call DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. It's anywhere in that 48 to 72 mm -hmm. hour, 24 hour, okay. we say. So what are you usually at then in soreness level? Are you a three, a six, seven, what are you? Uh, I will spend most of my time three to one. Okay. And you're seeing- Sometimes I'm going to four to five to six, um, depending on the phase I'm in. Yeah. If I'm trying to really push it, but then I'm gonna do that for four or five weeks. Yeah, but you see that you're getting stronger at a three, you see that like you're becoming- You get stronger to zero. Oh. No question, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go heavy enough um, under controlled range of motion with a low enough volume. So imagine this. I'll give you what I call my three to five principle. So for development of, of strength and power. Uh, now these are not the same thing, but they're close. Three to five is a very simple rule. If you're an advanced coach, you can go past this, but for the average person, it's a good starting place. So I want you to choose three to five exercises. So if you're feeling better that day, Maybe it's closer to four or five. If you're feeling worse or just starting, closer to three. Mm -hmm. Three to five exercises. I want you to do three to five reps per set. I want you to do three to five total sets. So imagine you're gonna go in and you're gonna do a goblet squat, you're gonna do a bench press, and you're gonna do some pull-ups. Mm -hmm. Three exercises. You'll do one, two, three reps, take a break, and you do that three times. There's mm -hmm. your three sets. You know, and maybe you do your pull-ups for three, you could do your bench for three, and you could do your squats for three, and you do that three times. And that's it. You're done, right? Three to five minutes rest. Three to five exercises, three to five reps per set, three to five sets. And three to five minutes rest between sets you know, for the working muscle. So you do your pull-up, you can do other stuff, but by the time you do your pull-ups again, it should be around three to five minutes. Mm -hmm. Three to five times per week. Yeah. So again, that's a very general rule, um, but if you do that, if you want power, stay pretty light and move fast. Mm -hmm. If you want strength. Yeah, do longer, yeah. Go heavier, just go heavier. Heavier. Heavier, right? Now the three to five minutes of rest is like, it's, it's quite it's exaggerated. A, it's a long time of rest, yeah. For, so, these, you know, for, for three reps, you're like, okay, I don't need to sit here for three minutes. Well, if you're doing a 95% deadlift, yeah. you're gonna take three to five minutes. Sure. If you're doing a 95% bicep curl, like, yeah, yeah. You probably need 20 seconds. Yeah, like, exactly. Let's be real. So it's just a rough idea. Uh -huh. um, again, for heavy or for strength, it's heavy, right? Because you need to activate those fast twitch neurons. Um, hypertrophy is a totally different story, but for strength and power, that's that's a it's a very good starting place. Um, yeah. Days you feel better, do more. You're not going to get tremendously sore from that stuff because the volume's not really high. Mm -hmm. So the total amount of work is it's not a lot. It can be yeah. pretty short. Um, you're going to get minimal. Things there. Um, so if people had 15 minutes a day, that's all they had to give their physical workout, this would be the strategy I'm hearing. You could if you want to do a little bit of power and you're like, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here yeah. at all. Let's go. Okay, let's do some. If you know how to do some kettlebell swings. All right, we're going to do some of those. Um, we'll maybe do some split squats. Mm -hmm. So uh, or a lunge variation, something like that. And maybe we'll do some push-ups. There you go. Boom, boom, boom. And you're going to go push-up, split squat, kettlebell swing and you're gonna pop, pop, pop on those kettlebell swings and you're gonna push up as fast as you can. You're gonna run through that thing four times. You're done. It's, it's a minimal viable. Yeah. Effective. Not best, but effective. Right, <laughs> not best. What's best? 45 minutes? No, time domain is relevant. Yeah. Um, in fact, typically, uh, the longer the workout is, re is longer is required for more pure strength and power development mm -hmm. because you need so rest. much rest. Yeah, you need rest. You want to go for hypertrophy or conditioning or something like that. Right. Those can be 20 minutes. Uh -huh. No question. And so it really depends if you're trying to develop skill, then you need more rest. Mm -hmm. And that, that's going to be longer. Um, I have actually a whole series of videos on YouTube where I just I walk down all these things. If you want to know exactly how to do hypertrophy, if you want to know exactly how to do endurance or speed or skill in like five minute chunks of just like yeah. here are all the numbers, that's a really easy place to go. I'm that three to five rule is a pretty good rule. Yeah, I'm curious about nutrition. Say we're, we're training at a high level physically. Mm -hmm. How important is the quality of nutrition and the right type of foods we're eating in order to optimize our bodies as well? Or can we train super hard and get away with it if we're having the sugar and alcohol and breads and um, processed foods as well? It depends on your definition of get away with it. Yeah. Um, I don't work with people who are interested in getting away with it. Right. Like to optimize the area. Yeah, so the answer is um, when we program nutrition, we don't do it, uh, calories are considered, of course. It's a, it's a standard place, um, macronutrients, but most people stop there. Our stuff is you're gonna get a nutrition plan 
that is micronutrient developed. So it's not just this is much protein and this is much carbohydrates I want. That's going to be there. But it's going to be this is, I want this food choice, this food choice, this food choice, because we need to get this much vitamin A. I want this much zinc based on your labs, what we figured out. Um, mm. So that's the level of precision we get with these high performers. Yeah. It is micronutrient developed. Um, supplementation will then fill in any gaps, especially if we have a time constraint or a calorie constraint. Mm -hmm. For example, I've got a fighter and they've got to do all this, but then they've also have to lose 35 pounds. I can't just give them more food. That's crazy, yeah. So we have to play with some stuff. Man. But the base of it is this, right? So yeah, yeah we're going to get there. Um, can you get away with it? Yeah. Like if you saw what most professional athletes eat. Right, they, yeah. Completely, yeah. completely nuts. Um, so yeah, you can, but like you're not going to get in the best spot. Mm -hmm. No no way. Uh, right. We're going to figure out what their body can handle and what they can utilize the most. And for a high performer, especially someone who's burning a lot of energy, um, we have to really be really careful about uh, generally scaring them away from foods. So we want to make sure that if something is not a fit for them, we, we don't want to go on there. Mm -hmm. um, but sugar is a very beneficial nutrient. Carbohydrates are very, very beneficial for performance. But It's when you're eating it though, right? Well, it's, it's everything. Uh -huh. What are you eating it with? What type? Are you, are you drinking um, a Capri Sun? Well, there's some times when that's, that's not a terrible choice. Right. <laughs> Sometimes not at all for what we do, right? If the average everyday person is just walking around drinking, like, of course, like, I'm never, I'm never going to advocate for that. Yeah. That's never going to be the message. Most people are burning very little energy. Uh -huh. We probably don't need much pure sugar. Most people don't really know what sugar means. They think sugar and they think Capri Suns. Um, they don't really understand what carbohydrates are. So that, like, there's a lot of misinformation around those topics. Uh, in general, carbohydrates themselves, nor sugar, are not inherently dangerous. Um, everything has a hormetic curve, right? Mm -hmm. So everything has a toxicity curve. Water has a toxicity curve, right? If you don't have enough of it, you're going to die of dehydration. Too much, you drowned. Everything has a toxicity profile. So it's, it's about understanding the context and mm -hmm. where that person is at yeah. and what they're doing. Um, so there are plenty of times where we're going to avoid certain nutrients situations, but then there's others where we're going to use it to the advantage. So I am, I am very fundamentally against the demonization of any strategy. I am very much pro understanding what's the pro and what's the con, mm -hmm. and then de deploying the right tool to get the quickest result in the situation. Yeah, I think people hear carbs and sugar and they're thinking, well, that's gonna, they're gonna gain a lot of fat, right? It's gonna be a lot of fat if you're having too much sugar, too many carbs, if you're not training, and that's yeah. all you're doing is eating that. I think a lot of people are worried about the obesity that's happening. You know, what is it, a third now, or more than a third of the U.S. is obese? It's an extraordinary number. And now it's going, it's, Depending on how you want to classify it, right. it's either 100 million or 200 million. Either way, it's It's a lot of people. How, how, how scary of a, you know, factor is obesity for us? How, how worried should we be about gaining too much excess fat yeah. towards our mental states, our moods, our emotions, yeah. our thoughts, our longevity, all these things. And so that's part one. And then what would be the main factors that you could say, if people don't have all day to obsess over this, but the main factors that yeah. that's like, I've got a few things I can do every day to try to burn that fat. What would you say would be those things? Yeah, let's do the first one. Uh, keep in mind a couple of things. My scientific practice so what we do in our lab, and when I work with athletes, general health is just not an area of my expertise. Right, you're looking to optimize Total. freaks of nature. So it's yes. not <laughs> the fact that I like am disregarding the obesity crisis. It's just not my area of yeah. scientific you see, expertise. You see human specimens that are elite totally. performers. And the occasional executives and yeah, yeah. stuff like that. That yeah. Okay, great, so we've done plenty of that. We have a whole program for just that stuff um, where we can come in and you get basically the pro athlete treatment and then you get on a, mm -hmm. a health plan that, that gets you there. Um, so w when I typically respond to questions in interviews, my brain is coming from, my default setting is, is this something I would do with my athlete? Yes or no, right? Mm -hmm. Other folks, their default setting is public health, right? And right. so then they say things, I roll my eyes, I'm like, like that's totally irrelevant for Right. But right, then they're right. rolling their eyes to me when I'm like, you can't do that. Like, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, I just want folks at home to understand, like, it's, it's where we're coming from mm -hmm. perspective-wise of what we're finding interesting. Having said all that, 
I think it would be very difficult to make a cogent argument that obesity is not a big deal. You're going to have a very difficult time scientifically arguing obesity is okay. Right. Like th this is this is not a place. Um, I don't want my professional athletes being obese. Right? Right. I don't care if it's the offensive lineman. Like it's not adding. It's not helping. You can be big and strong, but not yeah obese. Now sometimes it's like, hey, it's just not worth the juice. Is not worth the squeeze. So we just we just do what it is. I, I've got athletes right now competing in in season. Um, that I'm like, yeah, God, I think it'd be great if we lost 10, but mm. it, it's so far down their list of right. hidden stressors. They're trying to optimize these other areas, yeah. And we have found other things that are massive performance anchors that we're like, you know what, you're in season right now, there's only so much bandwidth you mm -hmm. have, let's pull these ones out of the ground yes. and we'll get, we'll, we'll lose some weight in the off season. Okay, fine. Um, so having said that, it doesn't take long perusing the research from every perspective, realize, okay, this is a problem. The second question, okay, like what, what do we do about it? I think it's also difficult to make a cogent argument that anyone has an answer because nothing's worked. Show me, show me how it's worked. Well, it worked for some people, but it's not working for the, the global population because right. people aren't taking action consistently probably, right? Yep. So you can make the argument that, okay, pick whatever eating style you want. Fine. Like, what's well, not working? Well, it worked for the, okay, sure, but it's not like, what, what argument do you want to make? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want to make the argument of what's the, going to be the singular solution for mankind? Well, that's, you, you, I, I'm going to walk out of that conversation. That's not an answer. Or do you want to talk about like what's generally going to be helpful for most people? Um, so I tend to defer to that because you're yeah. like, well, let's give yeah. people possible solutions. Um, I have seen general population folks thrive on a number of different eating strategies. Um, you can fast. You can not fast. You can eat a lot of carbohydrates and be fantastically healthy. You could eat very limited and be fantastically mm. healthy. Protein seems to be the linchpin um, that is most effective for most people. So in general, again. Having more protein or less protein? More. If you make sure you hit enough protein, mm -hmm. the carbohydrate to fat ratio for the general population seems to be not irrelevant, but it, it gives you context options. I feel like I do better on high fat. Okay, great. I feel like I do better on high carb. Okay, like great. Um, most people are going to do most better if they lock around protein for a number of, of physiological reasons. So um, we don't have the answers to all this stuff, though. So we have to. We do have to acknowledge there's a little bit of. There's not one magic food. Yeah. That's causing these problems. It is clearly an issue of hyperpalatability. I think you're going to have a hard time arguing that that's not a big contributor. What is that? The fact that food is so available and so good. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can eat some abundance of it constantly. Completely, right? Like that. You're too many calories, a lot of sugar, too much too much of all of it. Well, too much fat, too. Yeah. It's, it's both, right? There's way too much of all of it floating around. Um, you match that with our lifestyle changes. Okay, great. That we're not but, physically exercising as much. We're not stressing the body the way we should yeah, be. But, yeah. but that's not really helping people because everyone says, like, eat less and move more. Well, that didn't work either. So what are the solutions? Well, a lot of people are going to come in and say... We need to develop uh, drug stuff because people aren't going to just do uh. this. Okay, like I'm not on that train, but I get what you're saying because no nothing's work. We can't educate. That's not working. No matter, doesn't matter. Oh, this was wrong. It doesn't. That doesn't matter because there's so many people. It, it would have worked in a hundred million with all seven billion. It didn't. So landing on a solution here is is, is it's going to be the only way out of this is going, we have these three or four things, and this one worked for these people, and this one worked for these people. It's just, it's never going to be the demonization of a food item. Mm -hmm. That's never going to be the answer. It's never going to be a single pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. like, I, I will argue very hardly against that one. It's never going to be a single mental health treatment. It's never going to be a... Right. It's probably, unfortunately, the long game of like, well, let's understand that food matters. And here are a bunch of ways. You want to go paleo. You want to go Mediterranean. Right, right. You want to go, okay. Start like these testing are, stuff. These yeah, are yeah. all options. Mm -hmm. um, some of those things were less scientifically valid years ago. And now actually it's like, well, okay, that actually looks like that. That works. And, um, well, you can make a lot of complaining about a lot of them. But yeah, yeah. There's some results here. Yeah, yeah on, on all sides of those, positive and negative, right? Yes. Like you've seen the, the keto thing run up and then run back down and realize like. Right, right. The paleo thing and just be called different names over the years. Totally, and things, right. Yeah. Or it's just Atkins like, to paleo to keto to, yeah, yeah it's like, what's what the next What seems variant? to be core to it is 
there has got to be some sort of caloric regulation. Mm -hmm. There has to be. I'm not saying yes. ca calories in, calories out. That's all you have to do. Track your calorie. There needs to be some of it. Some, there has to be calories. calories are energy. So if totally. you're adding more, yeah. There has to be some regulation. And there's a lot of ways to do it. Mm -hmm. But that has to be there. Mm -hmm. More evidence recently is showing that ultra-processed foods are inherently worse, even when they're not for calories. Yeah. That seems to be true. Same. Processed food is not as good for you as... <laughs> totally, right? Um, organic, unprocessed, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of little problems within all those categories, yes. but like as a global message. Now, now here's yeah. the thing. You work with a lot of elite athletes and executives, and there's, uh, you know, so many different documentaries and people oh on both sides of the spectrum saying meat is the way, and then others saying plant-based is the way, and they... They both have cases that, that show different sides that seem pretty compelling. And uh, so what have you seen? And there's elite athletes that eat meat that seem to be crushing it. And there's elite athletes that eat plants that seem to be crushing it as well. So where, <laughs> where is, with the athletes you're working with, what are they mostly eating? Yeah. And who are the ones that you're seeing have... Stronger recovery, strong, uh, faster growth, um, less injuries, yeah. all these different things, higher performance. What are their nutrition levels typically like? Yeah, I'm just going to intentionally ignore the first half of your question. <laughs> um, my PSA is stay as far away from those documentaries as possible. All documentaries. All of them. The plant based, the meat based. All of them. Because they're all skewing towards one. Of course. Reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what's sort of funny? This is totally unrelated, but it's kind of not. Folks in the journalism space, whether they're making a documentary or selling a book, they love to point out the conflict of interest and bad science. If you think you're getting in bias, like clear, I've yet to see one where it's like, hey, here's a fair, because it wouldn't be interesting. It wouldn't be like, <gasps> right? It wouldn't be, right. well, like have a drink of water and that's equivalent to 28 cigarettes or whatever, like yeah. off immediately, right? That's, it's not true. It's not, um, it's not a genuine conversation, right? So all those things are the lowest level of information, um, which is sad because yeah. it's a fun way to learn, right? Yeah, absolutely. Number one there. Um, number two, to the real part of your conversation, is what do our athletes typically eat? Number one, the entire field is moving towards precision. Precision. Absolutely. And this is being able to say, okay, what is right for my body? Um, now, we have typically said, we've always said that message, but what's that mean? Well, try this, try that. Okay, no. It's not going to work. Go do this diet for six months. I need an answer faster. Can I run analytics on myself right now and get better precision instantaneously? And that's where this whole thing is going. Mm. That's our answer. Um, those stuff, some of those things are available now. Some are better than others. Some are, I'd say, hot garbage. I'm not going to name any mm -hmm. of them um, for those reasons. But the ones I don't like now, um, I still like the concept. They're moving the needle. They're, they're trying to move in this direction. Now, some of them are just trying to take money from you and sell false promises. But in general, the food, the, the place, the field is acknowledging we need to be able to let people know what's most likely to work for them quickly mm -hmm. and what versus is let them run a six month. Th right. People aren't going to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's just no way. Um, so with our folks, everything is that, right? It, it's, it's a combination of three main areas. We're going to run labs mm -hmm. in a lot of areas. We're going to do um, what we generally think of these as like surveys. So we're going to do questionnaires. And there's a lot of evidence-based questionnaires. So think about even things that are controversial scientifically. There are evidence-based questionnaires for toxicity mm -hmm. exposure. There's evidence-based questionnaires for gut health. Um, there's a lot of nonsense around dysbiosis and leaky gut, but there's also science there. So... Yes. Being able to figure out what is the garbage and the guy trying to sell you the next book and convince you that carrots or grapes or, I don't know, I'm making things up. I don't think I've ever heard because yes. I don't want to call anybody out. Um, but there's signs there too, right? So let's not throw the whole thing out. There are evidence-based questionnaires that can help you get guided there. So we're going to look at labs, we're going to look at questionnaires, and then we're going to look at symptomology, right? How do you feel? Are you noticing this? And then there are there's science that would be able to say, hey, this is correlated this symptom is correlated with this. Okay, fine. Correlation is limited to what correlation is. But when you see things land in the middle of that triangle, imagine a Venn diagram. Your symptomology matches your screening. Your screening matches some indicators of the labs. Are the labs perfect? No. Are the screens perfect? No. Are these perfect? No. 
But when something lands in the middle, you've got pretty good indication that to me, I'm taking action. Mm -hmm. I don't know 100% because we don't have a great diagnostic for gut health, but we have some. And we don't have a perfect diagnostic. You see what I'm saying here? Yes. When something lands in the middle of that target, yes. to me, that starts to become actionable. So that's what we're doing. And we're going to put them on whatever programs they need, whether this is, um, let's say that they are not, they don't respond well to carbohydrates. Are they in a position to where they need to? If they're not, then we're just gonna say, okay. Mm. But if you start pulling, for example, carbohydrates out of a diet, you become very sensitive to carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So when you reintroduce, you blow up and you think, oh my God, I'm terrible. Well, no, you're not bad with carbs. You have down-regulated your ability mm -hmm. to handle it because it hasn't seen it in a long time. Right. That's a trainable thing. If the athlete, I feel like, is in a sport or position where they need to train that, then we're gonna actually train it. Mm -hmm. If not, like we're gonna say, hey, your, your, weight, your body does not handle this. It's not worth mm -hmm. the thing. Are right. we in season? We're pulling it, most likely. If we're out of season and we need to get there, we're gonna build it. Cause some discomfort, cause some sure. performance drop, you get the idea. Um, in general, our athletes are eating mostly whole food, right? They're typically going to eat five or so meals a day, mm. roughly. Because like, they're performing so high, they're, they're training so hard. A lot of times they're training twice a day. Yeah, they need it. They, they, they don't do as well on two meals a day or right. one. They right. tend to perform much worse. Because we need that recovery to happen within hours because we're doing it again. Wow, that's crazy. So you need the nutrients to come in to be able to, to train again. Totally. Like, yeah. like we don't have 48 hours yeah. to recover muscle glycogen. I have four hours. Right. Because we're going to train again that day. Gee. Hard. It's right? amazing. Um, so what so whole foods. Whole foods is Meats, base. plants, fruits, nuts, seeds, all 100%. of it. 100%. Yeah, yeah, all of it. We're going to go for everything. Is um, there anyone just plant-based or just meat-based? I have worked with plant-based athletes before. Mm -hmm. um, we have had success. I firmly believe, I think the science will show you this, uh, you can perform very well physically, even as an athlete on a plant-based diet. Mm. Is this what, what sports are we talking? Is this MMA, like, we've worked with for sure. Um, plant -based, only plant-based? 100%. And they performed well? Yeah. They like, recovered well? Successful guess... MMA fighter for a number of years. Uh -huh. Never won a world championship, but that's, that's right, not right. a that's hard. Metric. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, multiple wow. times. We've done it in multiple sports, actually. Mm -hmm. um, You've also trained. It's harder. It's harder, tell me why. Yeah, it's, it's harder. We, we have to change things more often. We have to be very careful and pay attention to protein intake. Mm. It's more difficult to get because think about this. Um, Plant-based foods, can't, you, you can run these, these crazy um, schemes where you're like, well, look, the same amount of protein in four ounces of sirloin is the same in this amount of broccoli mm. or peanut butter. Great, but the peanut butter has four times the calorie intake. Mm. When I have a fighter in camp where we are cutting- He's gotta cut weight, he can't eat that. I cannot do that. He's gotta have like pea protein powder or something or whatever, yeah. And then we're starting to lose effectiveness and availability. Uh, interesting. So in someone who, again, not like, when you don't have these targets and you wanna say, can I live a lifestyle? Yeah, sure, and you can do, right. but calories do start to matter. And this is one of the reasons why we generally call animal sources of protein generally higher sources because it means they have more bioavailable, more complete proteins at a Less lower calorie, calorie mm. intake. And there's no plant-based protein that has a lower calorie intake right now, or there's? To to the amount of relative amino acids, it's, it's difficult to it's, get. It's tough, gotcha. Um, so it's possible, it's harder, is what you're saying. It is generally harder. For um, an elite level athlete is what I'm hearing you say. But for the general population, I'll put it's it just way. trying to live a good life. I can't think of a situation in which an athlete would come to me who's not currently plant-based and I would go, I think you do better on plant-based. I don't think, I, I've never had that conversation in over a decade of professional athletes. Um, I've had many come to me and I've said, okay, like. Um, if you wanna be plant-based, this is what it's gonna take. Right. It might be harder. Totally, and so, again, some of them have, like it's not actually been that difficult. Like a baseball player, mm. it's not really, like the physical demands are not incredible. Right, and if you've already been training and you have a baseline. Yeah. You don't have to be like building mass muscle. For an NBA player, it's, it's been more of a struggle. Yeah, because you're burning a lot of calories all totally. day long, running up and down. But it can, like, so if those things are there. Um, it's not inherently better for you. So, like, show me the data that it's better. Plant-based? Yeah. You're not going to you're not, you're not be able to show me it's better. There's, there, we have no indication at any scientific level that a plant-based diet would be advantageous for an athlete. For an athlete, gotcha. What about for, for a human? I don't think we have any evidence to suggest that it's advantageous for a human either. 
So don't look at any of these documentaries, obviously. No, don't watch. Yeah. The, I mean, they're, they're just they're just truly again. They're not genuine. That's that's mm, the biggest issue. Right, right. right? They're the one sided. Is what you're saying. And, you know, to be honest, I've watched a, a few of them, and I've got like those, the Game Changers. Obviously, you saw that I one. I couldn't do it. You couldn't watch. No, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I knew. I knew. It's so one sided. Yeah, I'm yeah. in the community. I knew. I yeah. knew this thing was coming. I yes. had actually. Um, it's because they don't also interview the, the elite on the other side and say there's well, a host of problems yeah. let's just say I knew about that documentary a long time before it ever came out mm-hmm. um, I get interview requests and stuff a lot yeah. and it's just like I, I don't want to support I, I knew on either side you're not watching documentaries I knew where it was coming and right, I knew right. it wasn't going to be fair right um, I'm not going to waste my time I'm not going to support these things um, which sucks because again people eating vegetables is great yeah and you're now not saying don't eat lots of plants and vegetables well and, I feel like the whole, whole community got stained a little bit mm. Because of a, a bad actor, mm-hmm. a disingenuous person. It's like, I don't like. I don't want that message. I just want like people to know, hey, if you're gonna do it, and there's people who are actually really good in that community. Yeah. Who, this is, and it's hey, it's not a panacea. It's also not like, show me evidence that in a in a reasonable diet that addition of meat is worse. You're not gonna see that either. Mm-hmm. So they make these false. They, they do a lot of logical fallacies. Um, Burden of proof, they're really good at flipping mm-hmm. and, and a whole bunch of things. So I, I find those things generally very uninteresting to talk about because yeah. you're just like, we're never going to go here. Um, but right. if an athlete came to me or a general person and said, hey, this is what I want to do, I would say, okay, if you're willing to run analytics um, and we can make sure that your micronutrients are on point, then like we can do this. Having said that too, most people who are eating even meat-based are not doing it well either. So it's not like, it's not like, right, right, right. like well, okay, you're getting like, what are they doing wrong? Just in like the same thing, right? Not regulating um, nutrient intake, totally disregarding micronutrients because of lack of understanding. Not regulating um, food intake. Consistency seems to be a very big deal. So if you look across more recent literature, you're going to see that. So the simple act of eating at a consistent frame um, allows you to, we'll say, burn more calories. So you can ingest more calories, say, the same way by eating consistently. Uh, compared against an inconsistent eating pattern. So just basic principles like that. We've talked mm-hmm. about having some caloric regulation. I don't care how you do it. Mm-hmm. Having a, a mostly whole food nutrient-based thing. Regulation of, this is what I call my 90%, by the way. It's like 90% of quality diets are going to do 90% of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it's these standard principles. Yes. It's regulation of um, variety of colors. Mm-hmm. So for polyphenol and a whole host of other important intake. You probably want a decently widespread of colors. You want dark, rich colors. Um, You need to understand fiber intake one way or the other. Um, These are the principles that are going to work mostly for most people. Do you want more fiber or less fiber? Well, so that's another example of, I go back to the water. Right, right. You Um, want the right amount. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You don't want to flood yourself with too much fiber is what you're saying. You're going to know. Yeah. (laughs) You're going to know really quickly. Exactly. Um, yeah, so in that example, the typical number we're going to throw around is like 10 grams or so per 1,000 calories. So if you're eating 2,000 calories a day, you're aiming for 20 to 30 grams of fiber. What does that look like in terms of, say, broccoli? Is that like a cup of broccoli? Well, that would be a lot of broccoli. That's a lot of broccoli. That would be, a whole, that would be more, bro- more broccoli than you want to eat. You want 10% fiber. 10 uh, grams. 10 grams of fiber. Per 1,000 calories. Per 1,000 calories. Yeah, so if you were, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a day. Yeah. Um, I just did this uh, yesterday. So let, let's say uh, I've got a um, NBA player. Just did the, these labs yesterday. Uh, I'll, I'll use a different example. Let's go with um, something that's more. I'll do a baseball player because the lifestyle is more akin to a yes. person, right? Um, you're gonna wake up and maybe you're gonna have something like uh, three or four eggs, maybe a little bit of diced up vegetables in there, maybe some aromatics, onion, garlic, or whatever, or eggs. If you're just like that's too much. Maybe you're going to have a little bit of blueberries. Um, you're going to have some raspberries. And then maybe even a little bit of avocado. If we want to go heavier on carbohydrates, we're going to kick out the avocado and maybe go sourdough, piece of sourdough bread, mm-hmm. something like this. If we have a specific mic- micronutrient issue, then we're going to choose the fruit intentionally. So I want you with a pear this morning, not blueberries. I want you with whatever the case may be. Um, you're going to go there, and then you're probably going to have some sort of nutrients three or so hours later, which are going to be mostly, say, a protein source. So say this is a, a yogurt with um, maybe plain yogurt. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a little bit of granola if you're going to go train right after it. Sure. You know, something like that. No problem. 
lunch, it's going to look very Mediterranean and mm -hmm. paleo-ish, right? So it's going to be a lot of greens and a lot of uh, vegetable. And then it's, um, depending on the person, maybe salmon, maybe not. Maybe we need to go way away from fish for a while. Maybe beef, whatever these things. So it's going to be some sort of animal protein for the most part with a big plate of vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, then they're going to go for another meal after that if they're on four meals a day or they're going to go into dinner. And I typically like to give them more carbohydrates at night. Really? Yeah. So same thing, but then they would get maybe rice or uh, quinoa or uh -huh. sweet potatoes or a whole host of things, um, depending on like their structure of their day. Sure. Um, that's a, like a, a pretty standard template if you will. I like doing a lot of carbohydrates at night. It really helps recovery. For athletes. Yeah, and it yeah. really helps sleep. Interesting. You, you give 50 to 75 grams of carbohydrate a handful of hours before sleep. You'll um, knock out. You'll like, yeah, but that doesn't help burn fat necessarily, right? If you do that at night. You're not going to gain fat either. Oh, interesting. Okay. No, not at all. But you're not going to burn it. Yeah. If you have carbs at night necessarily, right? It, it's it's um, the whole idea that if you eat carbs at night, you're going to store them and therefore gain more fat has been widely scientifically refuted. Interesting. In fact, um, if you look at like Mike Arms would be stuff out of Florida State, like very clearly shown that nutrients at night tend to add in fat loss. Interesting. And preservation of muscle. Oh, specifically wow. protein um, and even some carbs at night. And that, that's been so shown. So a little bit of rice at night is okay or sweet potatoes. And, yeah. Interesting. You need, now you need to balance this with your personal physiology, right? Yeah, yeah. So, some athletes I have eat right before bed. They feel great. Some people, boy, that's a recipe for not sleeping. Yeah. Um, high fat meals before bed tends to be a real big problem. Mm. Right? You're going to have, the, but not everyone. Uh -huh. So we're going to figure this out. This is a part of our day that we're going to construct that says, do you need to stop eating three hours before? No. Four hours before? 90 minutes? What's the number? Do we do a bigger meal and then a snack? Do we do a snack and then a big, like, what do we need to do? Um, I've had a lot of athletes that do very well with a really big chunk of carbohydrates, like almost immediately before bed, and then they just pass out and they're recovering. And they're, they wake out. Then the recovery is got just energy shoots up. Wow. Exactly. Ah, interesting. Now you're not going to want to do Capri Sun and no. like some healthy carbs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're going to do starch, <laughs> right? Like this is a yeah, really yeah. good thing to Sweet do. Sweet potatoes, potatoes. Yeah. All those things. Rice. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. You're going to feel really, really good. Um, calories matter, right? So as long as you're in a rough understanding of where your total carbohydrates are and your rough fat and everything like that, you're going to be fine mixing and matching. Um, but do keep in mind physiology is unique, right? If you're like, man, if I have carbs at night, I blow up. I then believe you. Then don't do it. I, yeah. believe, I totally believe you. <laughs> I don't think you're a liar. Yeah. Uh, but if you're just like, oh, no, I heard in a podcast. Like, like, no, we, we've got enough science to suggest that you're going to be just fine, especially yeah. as, a, as a moderate performer right. to recover. If you could, I mean, this is a hypothetical question, but if you could only choose... Let's say for three months, you can only choose five, um, five foods a day that you could eat. Oh boy! To help you optimize your life, and this is not going to be peak performance and training and this and this, but it's just going to be one of the, the best lifestyle I can live. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give you an Andy Galpin answer. Okay. So as you've probably seen, I'm generally one to be like, "Wow, well, it depends, bro." Like yeah, I hate I giving you, you these things, you. right? I'm going to give you stuff, yes. though, right? Um, you, as I mentioned a little bit ago, you will do better when you establish consistency. Yes. Interesting. I'm not against people doing a few, like you just outlined, of like basically eating the same thing every day. Uh -huh. You're not against it, yeah. Not against it at all. Um, I am against it as a long-term strategy because of the need for micronutrient variation. Micronutrients, though, on like a daily basis don't matter, mm -hmm. right? So if you got a lot of vitamin C today, but you didn't get a lot tomorrow. It's okay. Micronutrients are fine. Mi macronutrients matter today. Mm -hmm. Micronutrients tend to take weeks to What's months. What's the difference between micro and macronutrients? Macronutrients are carbohydrates, Protein and fat. Okay. Energy or structure. Fats and carbohydrates provide you with cellular energy. Protein provides structure. Mm -hmm. Some energy, but very little. Um, macronutrients tend to be measured in big units like grams. Micronutrients typically split into a handful of categories. Minerals, vitamins, mm -hmm. and then things like polyphenols. Okay. Right? Um, any of those nutraceuticals that are, that are lower... There, those tend to be measured in very small units, so micrograms or milligrams or very small things. Got it. Vitamins, um, technically the definition is vital amine. That's where the word vitamin comes from. So it's vital to survive. And amine being like a, a small part of an amino acid. Mm -hmm. So these are structures that have been identified throughout history that play a, a role in health. Mm. So for example, you can live without carbohydrates. You cannot live without vitamins. Mm. 
And if you have a clinical deficiency in a vitamin, you're going to get a disease immediately. You're wow. not going to get a disease from having low carbs. Right, right. Like, <laughs> that's the structural difference. Now, vitamins tend to be broken up into a couple of categories. You have fat soluble. So these are ones that um, they're, in, they're absorbed best when you eat them with fat. And they're going to be stored in your own fat. Then you have water soluble ones like vitamin C. So vitamin C is going to come in go into your bloodstream. Any excess, for the most part, you're just going to urinate out. Mm -hmm. um, Fat-soluble ones like vitamin D are going to stay around for a long time. And so because fat-soluble ones stay around, you don't have to have them necessarily every day because they're around and if your body needs it, it'll, it'll pull some right. out of tissue. Minerals, zinc, magnesium, rocks, basically, are quite different. You can play with vitamins. Like if you took a multivitamin every day, fine. You don't want to play with minerals. They have a much bigger physiological consequence. Um, magnesium is pretty okay. Like if you're just, not a bad strategy, right? But if you are just taking iron or you're taking zinc, you could cause a whole lot of, of important physiological problems. Mm. Um, so you wanna be very careful about dosing things. You wanna go even further, and now you talk hormones, mm. right? You, you play with hormones, you're in a whole new ball game. Right. Don't play with minerals. Multivitamin, you're fine. Like that's not one where I'm like, oh, don't take a multivitamin yeah, until yeah. you've had blood work done. Like, that's fine. Yeah, you're probably fine. Gotcha. Um, but I wouldn't go crush, especially for men. I wouldn't go crush iron as a supplement mm. unless you've had blood work done. Right. You can get into danger real fast. Interesting. Women, probably fine. Okay. Right? So there's different things to pay attention to. Um, so the micronutrients tend to be stable. When we change someone's diet and we're running their um, panels, I don't really run blood again for typically another 90 to 120 days, because it takes that long for nutrient status to really change that much. If, sure. you, if, you, if you're low on vitamin um, D and we give it to you, like it, it's gonna be a while before we see a noticeable mm -hmm. change. Sure. Macronutrients, it's, it's instantaneous. Yes. It's, it's, you ate more carbs today, how did you feel? I felt better, I felt worse. Okay, great. I gave you multivitamin today, how do you feel? You can't feel it. You're you not gonna know. feel, you you feel anything yeah, yeah. for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. the, the just general. Did. Okay. To answer your actual question. So the five, five foods you need on a daily basis. You give me five foods and three supplements. Okay, yeah, that's easy. Um, supplement number one, multivitamin. Supplement number two, creatine. Creatine. For everyone. Yeah, no question. All ages. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, over 18 or something. or You could even go earlier than that. Creatine, you think we should have every day? It, it, it is the most efficacious single supplement you'll, you'll ever find. <laughs> really? Tell me why. <sighs> Boy, we should probably have done this the very first Cre question. Creatine. So what does it do it is, for you? It is and, probably the number one to three most studied supplement. And this is like back, bringing me back to like 16 year olds back in high school, like creatine, getting that pump. Yeah, yeah, right? You remember getting mad when you hear about your, like a guy you're playing is like, oh, he's all hopped up on creatine. creatine. <laughs> <laughs> Guy's cheating, he's taking whey yeah, protein yeah. and creatine. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's so right? much stronger. <laughs> well, it works. Yeah, so tell me why it's creatine. So in the, early, in the 1990s... I haven't heard creatine in years, probably. Really? I haven't heard anyone talk about creatine in oh, maybe my. ever on the show. No way. I don't think anyone has told me, any nutritionist, oh, scientist, doctor, uh, you know, You're athlete. The biggest rock. I don't think anyone has told me creatine in the last nine years. It's number one. That I can remember. Tell me why creatine is okay. the number one thing we should be taking on a daily basis. Tremendous amount of science, right, which is a... Uh, means it's very robust. It works under a lot of different situations and a lot of, it's not only gonna work for old people or it's only gonna work like other supplements where, for example, if you're, everything has a curve, right? Yes. Or a curve. So if you are at the top of that curve and you're at the optimal range, whatever that means, right? Mm -hmm. Of vitamin C, for example, and I give you more vitamin C. Nothing happens. If I continue to give you more and continue to give you more and continue to give you more, you actually start to get worse. Right, because now you're overcrowding. Mm, too much vitamin C. Well, too much anything, right? Now, vitamin C is, like, again, pretty safe. Yeah, yeah. And that curve is long with vitamin C. Uh -huh. But other, other things, that curve is short, right? Um, we could go with any toxin. Same sure, thing, right? Sure. Like they just have a really tight curve, and it's like, hey, milligram and two milligrams, death. Right? Okay. Vitamin C is more like, okay, three grams, five grams, ten grams, like, you're still fine. Vitamin D, same thing. Like, you could do, you could do a lot of vitamin tons D. of yeah. vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some... Like we're, we're actually, like I can't tell you how many times we have improved people's physiology right now by pulling them off vitamin D. Mm. Um, we just got some labs back about two weeks ago and doubled 
uh, testosterone from simply removing vitamin D. Wow. You play with things that have hormone-like effects. Yeah, interesting. Okay. But creatine, now, with, though. Like, without, generally, vitamin D is super safe. Yes, yes. Generally, yes. A supporter, right? yes. You, you should be paying attention yes. to vitamin D. Um, I like precision. Right. Having said that, um, everything has this curve, right? So if you are here with vitamin C and I give you too much, actually things get worse. If you're cl clinically deficient and I give you that same amount, then things got better. Uh -huh. So you have to understand where on the curve you are with some of these things. Uh, testosterone is another easy example. If you're at a normal range, going normal to a little bit higher has very f nil functional effects. Mm -hmm. But if you're a little bit low to going to normal has huge yes. positive beneficial effects. Okay, um, Creatine, doesn't have a curve like that necessarily. So there's no clinical like deficiencies of creatine unless you have some of these really weird uh, conditions. But having said that, you can really kind of take it a lot and it doesn't kick back, there's no feedback loops. So I just keep powder, straight powder to the water, drink creatine all day. Yeah, it's, it's not gonna <laughs> go cause your bones to start excreting excess right. calcium or anything like, like, like other vitamins huh. and particularly minerals will do. Man. It's not a hormone, so it's not gonna change your regulation and production of growth hormone or anything like that, like other stuff do. So number one, ton of science. It works in a lot of populations, meaning if you're a little bit low on your creatine or you're already good, you're still gonna have an effect. It's okay. It's very cheap. Right. It's very accessible. Creatine monohydrate is all you need to really get to. Um, it's been, uh, the safety profile is outstanding. So we have very little it's evidence safe. to yeah. suggest it's gonna be detrimental to anybody. Long term. Um, long term or short term. Uh -huh. All that on one side and say, okay, so what's the risk of taking it? Well, basically nothing, right? Because of all this, which is different from any, not any, but a lot of other supplements. So you take creatine every day? Positive effects. Let's get here. <laughs> yes. You can take it every day. Do you yeah. take it every day? Or? Yeah, I try to. You try to. For the most part, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, I'll go through I'll go through phases internally uh -huh. where I yeah, do, yeah. do different things diet-wise uh -huh. and stuff-wise, but like, yeah. So to not get off topic here. Um, we associate it with stronger, bigger. Mm -hmm. And the 18, 1980s, 1990s, that was became pretty clear. And then I sort of left the field because I was just like, we know the answer. It's super safe and it works for athletes. And then other people started picking it up and going, well, what about for things like brain function? What about recovery from traumatic brain injury? Mm. What about um, cognitive decline? What about neurological health? There is actually strong data suggesting a relationship between creatine and depression. Mm. There is a, um, and to be very clear there, creatine is not solving depression. Like that's not how depression works, right? Has there some data to suggest it may be helpful? Yes. Um, there's a lot of other health benefits associated with it because think about it this way. The way you make energy biologically is it's gonna come from a number of sources. Creatine is actually the very first one. Mm. People think carbs and fat, and those are the predominant sources, but the very first place is actually creatine. It's a one, the stoichiometry is great, it's one to one. One thing of uh, creatine, one molecule of ATP. So you're not, it's not a high energy producer, but it's the fastest. It's stored in, inside the cells themselves, and they can directly create basically ATP, it, kind of. There's one step in between, you get the idea. Right. So it's very fast, but it burns very fast. The brain loves that. Mm. Astrocytes around the brain love it. And when, we, when you look at all the trials that have been done um, with any of these populations, cognitive decline, injury, neurological function, there is a lot of research moving with creatine in all of those areas. Um, mm. Again, it's not a treatment and it's not a cure for Alzheimer's. Sure. Um, some of the data suggests it's not doing much. And then some of it is like maybe there's a slowing of the reduction or slowing of the progression. Mm. Some say maybe not. Wow. But there's enough health benefits globally um, that we're basically saying, look, a lot of decline in cognitive, whether it's function or um, mental health, it's looking like an energy problem. Again, not exclusively, but it's, it's a mm -hmm. big deal there. Um, this is why you see trials with lactate, providing folks with lactate and seeing really good improvements in brain function with mm. the George Brooks and stuff, doing that with brain injuries. Interesting. Um, well, it's because those things like energy. and. We know that they prefer glucose because it's a fast energy source. Well, they actually love creatine as well in some of the places. So it is uh, creatine. It is a very, very useful, useful supplement. Yeah, no question. 
Wow. Okay. Um, so for your third one, yes, you know you could throw in, in general, fish oil. Mm -hmm. I, again, I pro I don't think we probably need to be smashing down as much fish oil as we as I would have said five or eight years ago, but safety profile is high. Add some in there. Okay. And what about so those are the three supplements? What about the five foods? Okay. Um, if you want to talk bang for your buck, it's very yes. hard to get past eggs. Really, man. I heard it's just so. I heard someone say that eggs is like one of the worst things. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> okay, this um, is the this is the challenge. I bring on people from all different uh, nutritional scientific backgrounds who will say these different things, and I think that's challenging for people is to figure out what really works for them. Yeah, but I okay, so eggs. Well, remember, science is the is a verb, not a noun. Mm -hmm. It's an action. It's a moving target. Yes, you want it to be that way. Yeah, right. So it's good. I love um, eggs. So for me, that's a good. Yeah, um, I have okay. some folks that. Eggs are a death sentence for them. Mm. So yeah, I, again, I believe you're like, oh, I get, I get no, uh, my nose runs immediately. Thanks. Uh, Great, take them out. Don't do don't it. Don't do yeah, it. Yeah. Most people though, it's uh, nutrient density wise. Yes. Um, that's a pretty good one. Um, I'll go with the potato. Really? Man, and talk about. There's uh, a lot of benefits with potatoes for sure. Tons of benefits as well as functionality in terms mm. of, um, it works well for the whole family. You can cook it a ton of different ways. Mm -hmm. Preparation methods. Um, they all change the nutrient profile, by the way. Uh -huh. All of it. Um, so you can make it into a resistant starch if you want. You can make it into a faster acting carbohydrate if you want. Mm. You can um, make it in a mash. You can make yeah. it, like you can do different things. Um, it's cheap, mm -hmm. high quality, and a ton of nutrient variety. Okay. Lots of fiber, lots of good things, energy source. Um, Potato, yep. So those are a pretty good one. I would say, I'm torn between blueberries. Yeah, I've heard that as a common with a lot of experts. Yeah, it's actually super top little, five. Yeah, like it's a fun uh, nootropic hack. I just don't like blueberries. Blueberries like taste. for performance, like big, big help. Mm. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, 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 there's been some literature showing it having a, like a fairly robust nootropic effect acutely. Mm -hmm. So you take it right now, like before you go perform. It's, it's gonna help better. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, it has double the mostly double the amount of carbohydrates relative to other berries. So if like calories are a concern, then maybe you would want to switch it for raspberries. Okay. You know, something like gotcha. that. Gotcha. Blueberries. Okay. Right um, that's a pretty good one. Let's see. Uh, another one that's a pretty big staple. Um, in meat, meat in general, uh, is it probably going to be pretty high on my list if you mm -hmm. let me count meat as one food just, item? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not like if you do. What's the optimal meat? If you just like, I can only do this type of fish. I'm going to do this type of. I'm probably going to take like pork. personally. Yes. I'm going for antelope. Antelope. Yeah, that's just because my freezer is stocked with it. Okay. Almost every year. Yeah. Um, we eat pretty much exclusively game meat like, uh, for our meat choice, if not fish. So okay. fish, elk, uh, or game meat, mule deer, and antelope are like. My house lives off those Okay, things. cool. Um, I realize but, that's not very... But if someone, the general population, would you say fish then? I'm if not against like... fish at all. Um, the only reason I'm hesitating is you have to be very careful of mercury toxicity. Yeah. It's a real issue. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've had this problem a lot over the years with folks who just love professional athletes that fish in the off-season and stuff like that. So Interesting. Okay. depending on your fish choice, right. stacked against each other, Heavy metals aside, fish is a very right. high quality meat. Gotcha. It's okay. a very good profile. Mm -hmm. um, and the fifth thing, I don't see any vegetables in there, right? I got yeah. the potatoes in there, but. Yeah, well, that, no, no leafy greens. Um, yeah. I guess you could say, I mean, I guess the easy answer is broccoli. It's probably the most robust. It can mm -hmm. be cooked in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, nutrient profile changes based on cooking preparation, so you can get variety by just cooking it differently. Yep. Um, it's not people's favorite. I like broccoli. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah. But like, put a little hot sauce, you're okay. Right, right. <laughs> like, you, you but it's it really, there's a lot of benefits of broccoli though, right? Tons. Yeah, yeah tons. Um, yeah. In a lot of ways. So, cool. that's probably like my five where you're like, well, that's the least interesting five that anyone's no, ever said. No, it's good. Yeah, it's <laughs> all that's good. A, that's a pretty good, um, what I would really say, I guess my advice for someone is, whether you want to do the five meals a day thing or three meals a day, one meal a day for the average person, it doesn't really matter. Get a plan get somewhat organized and try to be fairly consistent, mm -hmm. right? And then if you want to move parts out, so you go, hey, you know what, like my meat option for today is I'm going to go salmon today and then tomorrow I'm going to go sirloin and then I'm going to go lamb. Like all these things have pros and cons, mm -hmm. right? 
but you still have a structure. So you have yes. freedom with a little bit of structure and you, you, you're you not out there going like, what am I doing today? Pizza or yeah. burritos or like- <laughs> Mac and cheese, yeah. You're totally just <laughs> off the reservation. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you can kind of do that- That's cool. For three months, two months, whatever the case is. Um, the one key I'll say here is you want to eat for the average person in a way that fosters abundance and not scarcity. So don't go on a diet. Mm. Don't have cheat meals. Mm. Just eat. Just eat. And make food good. If you don't make food good, you're now thinking about... Cheating. You're like, what's all these bad foods I can eat? Yeah. Totally. So if you're like, hey, look, um, having a piece of wheat toast in the morning, like, it's just like my favorite thing. But they have it. Yeah. The cost to benefit ratio is pretty high. Like, if you're like, I could, I like toast, but like, whatever, I like a hundred. Well, then, okay, maybe... Maybe you cut that out and you, you what are not the toast is bad, but you get it. Like one point here is like, mm. figure out what are the non-movable parts. And then give yourself the ability to, to do that and then make things taste like you want. If you're just like, oh God, like, like oh, okay, eggs, but like I can't, then don't eat eggs. Like right. get them the hell out of there and find foods where you're like, dude, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And, and then preparation styles, right? So you're like, maybe when I use these herbs and spices and do it this way, I can handle it. Um, you have a chance. Yeah. But a crash diet, like we, we've just seen. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't and work. And one of the most popular studies or papers I've ever published was on intermittent dieting. Like, I can't even tell you how many downloads. It's just ridiculous. But, like, the evidence is very clear. Yo-yo dieting is, not good. is a huge problem. Mm. It's really bad for your physiology. It's not just the fact that you gain the weight back. It has detrimental. You'll mm. be in a worse spot than when you started. Wow. And there has, we have explanations of leptin and insulin, like the whole gamut uh, there's problems. So you really want to be wow. cautious of hard in the paint for a month and then completely mm. off the resume. Like, be more consistent, yeah. Sustainable. But you're also saying like having some um, restriction or fasting incorporation is also can be helpful. Like if you're... For some people. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, there's no magic yeah. to fasting. Yeah. There's no special benefit to it. Um, if it is a good system for you, great. Sure. If it's not, then don't, right, like right, there's right. no, like don't make yourself, it's that immediate risk delayed gratification stuff, mm -hmm. right? So if it's like, if it's just ruining your life, it's don't, not don't, worth Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> if you're like, well, it kind of sucks, but like, it's the only way I can control myself, then mm -hmm. it's probably worth the exchange. Right, right. I mean, I have a friend who's like this with even carbohydrates, and we've gone through this so many times, and he knows, he's like, I know carbohydrates are not bad. I can't control myself with them, though. I just eat so, so for me, yeah. I have to just go. I can't eat them. And he he goes to these wildly, like he's in this, this space, so he like he goes to these wild changes in diets like all the mm -hmm. time. He's like, that's the only way I can keep my brain from just going completely bonkers. So I'm like, okay, it's, it's not necessary, but if you have to live uh, really hard rules, mm -hmm. and he's like, well, that's the only way I can do it. I'm like, Fine, right, great. So some people do really well with the band aid pulled off and just sure, sure. You eat this same lunch every single day. Um. One of the reasons why I love working with bodybuilders is like they're kind of like that. They're, if I told them to eat that, they'd be like, dope, let's go. Okay, let's go. Yeah, like, let's go. Broccoli, yeah. chicken, cool. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> and then people are like, oh my God, I made it a yeah. day and a half and I quit. This yeah. is terrible. Yeah. So m make sure it matches. Um, yeah. Well, I have heard from a lot of different of the longevity, I guess, scientists, there are benefits to fasting for longevity. I don't know if that's. I would say that's extremely contentious. Okay. Um, like I would intermittent say fasting or even. I am not convinced at all that that adds a special benefit to aging at all. Okay. Um, what about for burning fat or helping? No. Fasting doesn't help burn fat? No, that, that data is clear. Really? No, not at all. No, in terms of like, if you look at the literature on fat loss over the course of, pick your number, 16 weeks, six uh -huh. months, six years, you're going to see no inherent benefit of fat loss with fasting. So what is the benefit when, of fasting then? When protein is accounted for. Okay. So if you're matched for protein, if it's a strategy to help you eat l less food, uh -huh. then it will definitely work. Right. And there appears to be very little physiological harm to fasting. Right. No downside, especially for a non-athlete. I'm not against it at all. Sure. So I, I want to make it clear. Like, I'm not at all against I right, use right. it personally. Yeah. Not all the time. Um, I'll use intermittent fasting. I'll use prolonged fasting mm -hmm. as for other reasons. Um, we don't typically use it with an athlete in season, though we will use it off season mm -hmm. occasionally. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against any of these things, but I, I don't think it's fair to think it is a, if you don't do this, you won't live as long as you could have. Mm. Um, 
I, th I think that, that is extremely scientifically debatable, mm, okay. which is, I think, the most fair way to say it. So I could be wrong. Yeah. And I'm open to that. Yeah, yeah. I could be right, though. Sure. <laughs> um, if you look at fat loss, that, that I think that's, very, that's much clearer, that there is no special benefit for fat loss. Right. Really? really no. By fasting, there's no, there's, you won't burn when fat. When calories and protein are equated, absolutely not. Interesting. And, and those, those trials have been done. Wow. Um, you have intervention trials. You have... Um, observational stuff and mm -hmm. it all is like landing in pretty much the same spot that that that's not a huge interesting for the group yeah yeah for the individual maybe right if it is better for you better for you sure, sure always sure. the case but as a net positive like do you really need to go out of your way to fast to lose weight no oh okay. no not at all interesting. um it's a great strategy right right it, sure. it works yeah but. but we have a lot of people who've lost a lot of weight Without fasting. Totally. Well, there you go. So yeah. um, this is a difference of, I would say, it's, it's not that folks that are in a different position than I am are liars. That's not how science works. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you can't. They can't fake data. Like, I choose to assume that they're all not Doing their that. best, yeah. Yeah, of course. It's a difference of opinion of, of what is an actionable piece of evidence versus not. So some people think they'll see evidence in, say, um, an animal study, and that is actionable. Well, the, in, in this particular case, um, we, we can't say differently. I can't tell you it's going to worsen aging. Mm -hmm. I don't have any evidence to suggest it makes it worse. Right. I don't have any, they're, 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 it's very hard to do a human longevity mm -hmm. study. So they say, hey look, there's no downside. There's a plausible upside. It's worth the risk. Right, right. I say, well, you have a plausible upside, you have no risk, but your plausibility is questionable. Um, the things that are working in the animal don't carry over to the human, which we've seen in other things. I don't think it does anything. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's simply a matter of what you choose to be actionable or not. You move that up to the human trials. I think where it differs is this. Let's say, I'm making this up, but let's say there was a study on fasting in animals and it showed um, it worked. And then someone was able to do a magical 60-year trial in humans and it showed it didn't. Well, if the people then continue to push the animal stuff saying it worked, then that's malpractice. That's misinformation. Mm. Because you have evidence in human that challenged that thesis right. and it showed it clearly didn't work. That's right. not the case. Right. Right now it is. This is the only level of evidence we right. have. We're seeing that it's working here with these animals. And right. so it could work. I think the rest of the evidence stacked on top of that. And my thought is this is not going to carry over to humans. Mm, interesting. I don't think it is. Well. They think it does. And that's the differentiation, yeah, right? Yeah, interesting. Um, we see this with, in the case of the fat loss, we have carried these, not we, but scientists, have collected, the, have collect, run these trials on humans and it did not work. And so that's why I'm very firm in that one. Mm. Because we've run those experiments in the humans and it didn't work. Interesting. And um, to me, then to use mechanism study mm -hmm. or animal or cell culture models or yeast models or anything like that, to, in the face of human evidence that's not just observational, mm -hmm. to me now it's like, what are you doing here? Like we have good evidence in humans. Um, these studies could be wrong and other yeah, stuff. Yeah. So like you don't need to change your career or anything. But to me, I'm going to, the message I will send then is, hey, look, this is not a necessary thing. It's not particularly special or advantageous. Um, wow. But this is a moving field. Yeah. No question Always. about it. Yeah. So we don't know per se um, what matters for fat loss Consistency number one, right? Not within your timing, but if you don't stick to some principles, whatever those principles are, it's not going to matter, right? right. So um, we always say like the number one thing for fat loss is adherence. Whatever your plan is, if you don't do it, it's like you're mm -hmm. out the gates. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people simply don't adhere. Mm -hmm. So conversation over. Right. Just like, can we work on that side of the equation? Then, then that really matters. Um, there's a lot of other reasons I love fasting for like really fun stuff, but um, we have done this a so lot. So you like it, you do it. You recommend it for certain things, I, but I think, I think the message, though, that you have to do it to improve your longevity, I think is wrong. Right, right. Well, I don't think it's you have to to do that, but I, I've seen there's benefits. I don't, I don't think it will. I'll even right. say further. I don't think it will aid in your longevity at all. Wow. I don't think that there is, um, as a general rule, a positive needed effect of aging or of, of fasting. Interesting. I think there is a positive needed effect of caloric control. Like that. Okay. That seems to be pretty clear. So less calories. Controlled calories. Controlled calories can help you live longer. You don't see people at 105 at 400 pounds. Like you're just not going right. to see that stuff. 
If fasting is your method of that, fantastic. I see what you're saying. Great. Uh, and we've, I've done studies. So um, 2010, I worked with a guy named Per Tesh, very famous muscle physiologist in Stockholm. And we studied athletes that were 80 years old or more. So 89-year-old athletes. So these were people that were Olympic and world champions in the 1940s and 50s. And they have not stopped competing. Wow. Uh, skiers. So they skiers. Have a, yep. They have a race over there, which is Jeez. like their equivalent of the Boston Marathon, but it's the ski version. So thousands of entrants a year. I'm talking about uh, not downhill skiing, but... Um, Cross-country skiing. Cross-country skiing, yeah. You're not breaking legs the over best here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> breaking hips when you fall. Yeah. The best in the world are doing two hours. Yes. You know, the average person four to five. So it's yeah. like a, a rough mm -hmm. cultural equivalent. Um, so these folks were have done that race for 40 to 50 consecutive years. They've not stopped competing, right? Mm -hmm. They're entering these things. Um, and we've, we've gone over there. We've taken blood. We've taken muscle samples. We run VO2 maxes wow. on them. Like the whole shabam, right? So these are the most successful folks. In fact, we broke an unofficial official record. Of, we had a 92-year-old with a VO2 max close to 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is the, what like an average college kid would be. Wow. That's, pretty, right? that's pretty cool. Yeah. Th these folks are not fasting. Mm. Well, they, they can't when they're competing at that high level also. Maybe, maybe not, right? If you're not training like that, totally, you want to be able to. But I think for the average so human to me, I'm like, who's sitting around all day and not moving their body. Yep. I guess my point here is I don't think you're going to get to 90 super well if that training part is not a piece of the equation. You need the training part. you yeah. got to have the training yeah, yeah. part, right? And so with your training, you're going to be eating. A little more. You can't be, yeah. Totally. So th those folks. So it depends where you're at, and that's your son. Yeah. So all of these, um, again, need to be moved forward as viable options. Mm -hmm. Now I'll even say this: if you would have asked me this question eight years ago, I would have, um, I would have probably tried to convince you that there are negative effects of fasting. Mm. I was wrong. Mm. I, I think it's very. Like, we have some athletes that'll even do it. Yeah. And be fine. You can clearly do it. Um, so I've changed my position on that piece a lot, but. Um, to, to think that it is requirement for fat loss, no, because when we've tested any number of athletes and looked at things like metabolic efficiency or metabolic flexibility, these are grossly misconstrued in the pop, cult, pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, metabolic flexibility is not what most people think it is to be. Um, it is very trainable, it can be moved, and it is very, very important, and you do not at all have to go on a low carbohydrate diet or fast at all to become really effective at burning fat. Yeah. Burning fat is also not the greatest proxy for fat loss. What is the best thing to do to burn fat and for fat loss then? So there's no single best thing, right? It's gonna de depend on you. So I'll give you some things. Okay, I have a lot of uh, videos you can go if you wanna see this entire breakdown of um, metabolism, but uh, think about it uh, very quickly this way. Carbohydrates and fat are the primary places you're going to get energy from, right? And think about this as, in general, carbohydrate is there for faster time, less energy um, per molecule, per mm -hmm. weight. However, it's less. This is important. Um, carbohydrate is more oxygen efficient mm. than fat. Okay. But the total amount of energy per gram of fat is far higher, yeah. like tenfold. Yeah. If you're concerned with fat loss, it's not about burning fat. Because if you burn a ton of carbohydrate, you have to restore the carbohydrate some way. Mm -hmm. And you can't, it's, it's difficult to convert fat into carbohydrate. But here's what happens. If you burn more fat, if you eat more fat, if you eat more fat, you're going to burn more fat because you've given your body more fat. Mm. But you're also going to store more fat. Right because you're giving yourself more fat, right? If you eat more carbohydrates, you're going to burn more carbohydrates, but you're going to burn more, store more carbohydrates. Store, so how do we burn it then? Cool, all you have to do is make sure the total balance of two of them is lower than what you're burning. It doesn't matter. If you wanna keep the carbohydrates up and the, pro and the fat low, fine. You wanna keep the fat high and the carbs low, fine. You wanna keep them both like kinda low, it doesn't matter. In terms of actual fat loss, six months or six weeks or whatever down the run. It doesn't matter. We can play games by mm. giving you food before your workout and bias is what we call bias the energetics. So if I want you to burn more fat, I'm gonna give you more fat before your workout. But mm. you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna store more fat. Yeah. I'm gonna give you carbohydrates to the direction. If I need the energy faster, like in a sport like 
a 100 meter dash track and field, mm. we're gonna hedge towards carbohydrate. If we wanna do a long, pro prolonged exercise that time doesn't matter, like your marathon, mm -hmm. we're gonna go more towards, now a fast marathon is still gonna be carbohydrates. Mm. A fast marathon, even a two hour marathon is still 85% carbohydrates. What if we're doing a six hour marathon? What should I be eating before? Yeah. You can do, you have the bandwidth to do whatever you want. Right? There's a lot of- <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to get right? through it. Yeah. So what happens is because it, it's regulating these places, your body's gonna say, if we have excess fat come in, we're gonna burn some of it as fuel as we uh -huh, can, uh -huh. but we're also gonna store more because we have excess, right? So this, this, this de novo lipogenesis, the ability to take extra carbohydrates, and then the leftover ones get stored as fat, is very difficult to do. Mm. What happens is you just store them as carbohydrates. Yeah. So imagine this. You had too many carbs. You wanna know how, this is how carbs make you fat, by the way. It's not that those things get converted into fat. That's a very difficult process. You're gonna take a bunch of those carbohydrates and you're gonna store, you're gonna max out muscle, and you're gonna max out blood glucose, <clears throat> and you're gonna max out the liver. And then what happens to the rest? Well, it says, hey, any little bit of fat that we're burning right now, turn it off. Mm -hmm because we have so much extra carbohydrate, we're only going, and so you become very carbohydrate burning, doing things like this, what we're doing, which should be a very fat dominant thing because we don't need energy quickly right now. So the excess, cal mm. excess carbohydrate ingestion is not converting into fat, it's simply lowering the rate of fat burning. Gotcha. Ingestion of over fat does the same thing in the opposite direction, right? Right, right, right. So this is how it's gonna lead to excess storage of actual fat. It's not that you're converting one you know, from the other, it's the fact that it's regulating or what we call partitioning uh -huh. total utilization. So you have the bandwidth for fat loss to do whatever you want. Um, so the idea of metabolic flexibility is when you need energy quickly, you're have gonna carbs. move to, move towards the, the carbohydrate side. Yeah. But when you don't, you're gonna be able to be really good at the other side of the equation. Mm. Okay. You do not need to fast. You do not need to have lower carbohydrates to get good at fat burning. That's complete garbage. What do you need to do? You need to be able to be good at fat burning. If you wanna get better at it, can you practice, okay, here's a quick test. Um, if you can wake up in the morning and go like for a 30 minute jog without food, and like you feel fine, maybe you're hungry but you feel fine, then you're probably decent at fat burning. Mm. If you are a complete wreck and you can't get 15 feet, then you're probably very poor mm. at using fat as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So if we have you do like a time trial and whatever thing you do, and you just, you tank, you should have more than enough energy. You might be hungry because you're used to eating breakfast, but you don't have, your blood sugar is not going to be low. You have way more than enough blood sugar uh -huh. to do what you're going to do. So that's a very easy litmus test. Yeah. Um, if you want to push that ability, you can practice fasting. It, it will work. You don't have to. Um, you can get simply better at doing things like nasal only. Breathing. Endurance stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So do whatever it takes, breathe through your nose only. You can train, you can do a little bit of fasted training. You don't have to. You could work on simply eating fat before your workouts. Not carbs. Push that system. Yes. Yeah, right? Like all of these things um, are, are very easy to work. And we've had athletes that have problems on the other side too. They're so good at fat burning that they're slow starters. Mm -hmm. And so we have to work on their ability to use carbohydrates. So we push that into the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very easy to do, uh, to move, well, Conceptually, it's easy to do. Right. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's going to work. And it, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle for those folks. Yeah. Um, so that's that's generally how you can get fat burning yeah. done. It's um, movement can work, but you don't have to. Mm. Diet is your biggest yeah. player there, no question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is energy control is real. If you are crushing your energy control with stimulants, you can just guarantee a loss of physiological function. Mm. So if you're in this situation, okay, I'm doing 10 milligrams or five milligrams of melatonin at night. Okay, great, fine, because I can't sleep. Wake up the next morning and I'm doing stimulants, whatever, however you want to justify mm -hmm. them, all day. And I ask, how's your sleep? You're like, pretty good. And I ask, how's your energy? Pretty good. And then we look at physiology, I'm like, well, your physiology is not very great. I feel fine. Well, you don't actually feel fine. You're just cycling drug to drug to drug to drug to drug to drug. Mm. And I'm not against either one of those things, right? But you're, you're sort of blinding yourself a little bit because if I take either one away. How are you gonna feel? You, yeah. you feel ha awful. Mm -hmm. You can't, uh, no energy, oh, okay, great. So you're actually not very good at producing energy. You're very good at giving something else to produce energy for mm. you. That's not an optimal physiological That's state. That's not good, yeah. 
optimal physiological state is you can't sleep fine without anything. You can perform fine. Maybe we're a little bit better when we use them. And now these things give us like a little bit of extra juice. Uh -huh. But that's a difference between taking us from really ne good to some extra it. juice yeah, to yeah. like, I can't function. Right, right. And I can't tell you how many labs we've had come back recently where people have next morning melatonin concentrations that are 10 or 100x upper range limits. They're walking around sedated. Even though melatonin is supposed to have like a 60 or 90 minute half-life, right? It should be gone fairly quickly. But they're taking so much of it. Mm. In fact, a study came out very recently showing the actual amount of melatonin in your supplements can range up to 100,000 X what you think you're taking. So you think you're taking three milligrams. Mm, but it's more. Way more. Wow. And so people are walking around sedated and that's where they're going to nootropics and more coffee mm. and more nicotine, which again, I'm not, it's any of those things, but like we have to have a little bit more control. The easiest way around all this stuff is like eat a simple diet, drink water, regulate stress, sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's come back to the baseline. What do I feel like when I'm not taking microdosing LSD? Like, what do I take when I'm not? <laughs> right, right. Like when Smoking I'm not weed doing, every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. having gummies and this and this. Totally yeah. right. And then you can go. Okay, actually, like I was just regulating everything coming in, uh -huh. and now we can start playing here and here. And yeah, here. yeah. But we have been generally pulled people off of things more than we put people on things. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you just lose any sense of normalcy, mm -hmm. which is a challenge. So. Lots of information here, Andy. You've got a YouTube channel with a lot of this stuff. If people want to nerd out and go into the data, they can see all your YouTube videos there. Your Instagram is really fun to check out. A lot of good tips there. you got a book as well, um, which is about getting unplugged, right? It's, it's evolving from technology to upgrade your fitness performance and consciousness. I wanted to go more into consciousness and exercise and things like that, but I think maybe we'll have to have you come back on next time to give people some, some time to digest this, but um, you also have your lab. Uh, I don't know if people are able to go to the lab if they're in, L if they're in uh, LA, or if it's more for just high performance athletes, but yeah. you've got a whole center there where you're sharing the research yeah. online from the lab, which is really cool. Uh, people can go to andygalpin.com. Uh, your YouTube as well as that's just Andy, is that Dr. Andy Galpin? I, th I think it's yeah. just Andy Galpin. Andy Galpin was there. Sure Instagram, up. Twitter, Facebook, we'll have it all linked up as well. How else can we be su uh, supportive to you today? What can we do to support you besides checking out your site and all the information you have? Yeah, I think the a couple of things. Um, so my YouTube page, a little bit more context there. I built that a number of years ago simply because I thought it's kind of weird how people want and need general tr exercise and nutrition mm -hmm. information. And I, I can only do this 35 students at a time and right. I'm waiting, like this is just not a thing. So I just thought like, can I just start taking all of my university lectures, yeah, all the seminars I give, all the private speaking engagements, and can I just put them up on YouTube for free? Turns out you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all it is. So you can take any of my graduate level courses in strength conditioning, nutrition, all these things, um, or some of the more advanced talks I give, like I just put them up there in five, 25, and, 55 minute physiology ones. Um, that's just all I, I just pay out of that. I don't have like a, I don't, I don't have a company or anything yeah. that does that. So that is a Patreon model. Cool. So if anyone wants to support that, I take that money and I, I have an intern actually, a uh, student, and he's like, I know how to produce videos and I know how to post to YouTube. And, there you go. And we're actually trying to up the ante on that quite a bit to make them way more user friendly uh -huh. and, and stuff and provide notes and all that stuff. So that, that's probably the easiest way. Um, if you're more of the high ticket person and you're interested in supporting research, um, we are. You know, our lab is a is a nonprofit, so we can get a nice kickback on on lab donations. So that's great, man. That's always a. That's something you need more resources. Yeah, we don't fund uh, this type of research is not fundable. Yeah, we're not making drugs, and we're not. Yeah, doing exactly. Things. So and they can go to your they can go to your website and learn more about that, right? Or they can donate. Uh, yes. I don't have any of that stuff up there now. <laughs> You'll put it up there after this talk. Yeah. This talk. And then uh, that'll have links to um, the, our other programs. So the Absolute Rest program for okay. the sleep tech. Um, I'll make sure that gets up on the website. Absolute our, Rest, uh, yeah. Our Rapid Health Optimization program, which is our the executive program. So if you want kind of the athlete mm -hmm. thing and then you want someone to take you through the training and stress reduction or breathing, whatever it is we find. So it's a Rapid Health Optimization program. Um, and then if, if you are more the athlete type, that we have our biomolecular athlete. That's that side of the equation. So Interesting. We can run all those labs and everything and get you your complete biomolecular blueprint. 
and then provide solutions. Oh, that's cool. So you can run labs for people. We can. That's cool. I love yeah. it. It's not a um, it's not a high throughput thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a waiting list. But, sure, sure, sure. Uh, Sign up for that waiting list. Depends on how are you are you up sometimes. Yeah, people yeah, get to skip that yeah, live. I know. Maybe I can skip that live, yeah. We had a couple just jump in. I'm like, well, you're the we are the number one player in the world in multiple major American sports. So nice. Yeah. They got to jump the line. They'll get it there tomorrow. Yeah, no yeah, offense. Yeah. <laughs> but they got to jump. I love this, Andy. A couple of final questions for you. We'll wrap things yeah. up. Uh, this is called the three truths. Imagine okay. it's your last day on earth many years away. You get to live as long as you want to live. And you accomplish all your dreams, but for whatever reason, you got to take all of your information with you, or it's no longer around. All your content, your work, your books, your videos, this, it's gone for whatever reason. But you have three lessons you get to share with the world, three truths mm -hmm. that you would leave behind from all of your life experience, knowledge, research, whatever it might be, as profound or simple as the truths might be, what would you say are those three truths for you? Wow, that's an interesting one. Number one would be, I'm just going to steal this. I just think I'm going to say ownership. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge, huge proponent of that. I don't think I need to explain that more. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Your listeners have probably heard people talk about yep. that. Um, number two, I'll say, I'll just keep it one word, perspective. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, Truth is not as common as you think. We live in gradients. Mm -hmm. And what seems to be completely true for you may not be completely true for somebody else because of their perspective. Right. And we need to understand that science is not a thing that produces proof. It's very difficult, borderline impossible to prove. Right. All we do is play on levels of certainty. Uh, if you go back to any parts of our conversation, there are some of those things where I'd say I have tremendous certainty on. Um, you need water to perform, perform very well, right? And you need an, an X amount of water. I'm pretty certain about that. Other things we've talked about, I start to lose. I might still be like, yeah, this is true, but I have less certainty and I'm willing to entertain ideas that are moving. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not willing to entertain an idea that you don't need water. Right. Yeah. There would have to be tremendous evidence right. for me to even not swipe right by your post. Right, right? Right. Like, I'm not listening. I'm not listening or reading a post about how all you need to eat is liver. Uh, the burden of proof there is so extraordinary. Like, maybe I'm wrong about that in 10 years. I'll see, but most likely I'm not. Because right. so many of those things come, and you're most likely to be right most times up here. But then there's some things where I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, ah. yeah. So perspective is key. Yeah. You have to understand where you're at on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. The last one would be, I'll call it intentionality. Okay. And what I mean by that is, and this is part of the stuff we got to at the end of my book that um, we, we talked about, are you pushing towards adaptability or pushing towards optimization? Are you, most people don't even realize that every action you're doing is moving you in one of these directions. So if you can just zoom back a little bit and start to think through, I'm going to change this one. Okay, I'm going to explain this better. I'm going to call this first principles. First principles? First principles. Are you familiar okay. with first principles thinking? No. Okay. It's, I'm surprised. It's very common thing in the the business leader space. Um, so first principles is a line of thinking that suggests go back to the very foundational beginning, go all the way to the bottom to where there is no more assumptions. And you just simply work your way up. Uh -huh. Anytime you see an assumption, you stop and you confirm your case is in fact true there. And this works so well for managing relationships you, you can already see the application there, right? Like, mm -hmm. Where are we going to go down to? Right, what right. fundamental truth do we agree upon? Let's go back. Wherever that is, as a, if that's a very bottom level, we're going to agree upon that truth. And we're just going to go to the next level. Do we agree here? Yes. And you're just going to walk up uh -huh. until you find a place of like, and you'll just, you won't, you'll be so shocked with how many assumptions are baked in mm -hmm. to things that you, you're just assuming. Um, so questioning those assumptions and going back, and it works for relationship stuff, it works for nutrition, it works for, should I be doing this today? It works for, do I really have to go see this person? Do I mm -hmm. really have to? 
just come back to first principles. Where's the fundamental thing that we agree upon? And then where is the assumption breaking down? And mm -hmm. you'll just be shocked. Like, I didn't realize. I assumed. Right, right, right. You were willing to put your career in front of your wife. Right, right, right. You weren't. Okay, like this is, now I see why you're mad that I gave you this recommendation because I thought here you mm -hmm. didn't. We, we missed. So sure. go back to the very first principles and when you're solving problems, whether it's with your company or it's physiology or new tech or whatever it is, just start there and walk up. Um, this is Elon Musk, mm -hmm. right? Everyone said you can't make batteries, blah, blah, blah. He's going back to me. Okay, what do, what do we assume? Right. You're assuming we can't make batteries cheap. Why? Well, you can't. Why? You can't. Why? Right. Oh, here we got an opportunity, right? That's all. If you could, did. Well, how would you do it? Yeah. Totally, right. This is um, I could give you examples of sure. scientists in our field mm -hmm. who you think things are just like they're in our textbooks, and I've taught. I give you so many examples of things I've taught over the years, and I'm like, oh, I, I just assumed that was it's in the right, book, right, right? Yeah, yeah. And then somebody came along and said, well, "Where's that paper?" Question well, of well, the assumption. The yeah. well, where's the paper? Where's the first paper? And you go back, and you're like, actually, this was shown one time, 1970, in six people, and then it just like, yeah, um, that was that totally changed the way we train muscle hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. Brad Schoenfeld just did that, right? And it's like, we have so many people, you're like, I never thought to assume. I just... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just really go back to first principles thinking and... Um, I love it. it. My man, I love this. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Andy, for the, the constant search of moving the human body forward. You know, the constant research that you're diving into, the constant testing and tweaking, the optimizing of humans. I think it's really cool that you have a lab that you get to work with great athletes all the time, college athletes, pro athletes, and see what's working for the rest of us. So thank you for doing all the work and, and the research and diving in and publishing this information and making it available for us as well for free on, on YouTube and everywhere else. So really appreciate it, Andy. Uh, final question, what's your definition of greatness? Exceeding your own expectations. Whatever your coverage is, when you outkick it for yourself, I think you've done great. Mm. There you go. That's all I'm going to say. My man. Appreciate it. Thanks, yep. Andy. Vaping is not identical to smoking, but you might be trading one known nasty thing for an unknown nasty thing. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so I think it's just, and, and you have to remember how long it took before the evidence implicating smoking became dispositive. I mean, that really took about 60 years.